and now we're now we're cooking. I hope. Okay, this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted here at the Niles Public Library in the large meeting room on the Thursday afternoon of October the 15th in the year 2009. And the veteran that uh, Mr. Charles Motz, who's being interviewed today, his birth date was April the 4th, April the 18th, 1919. Uh, we're delighted that Mr. Motz, who's a resident of Niles, has uh, uh, come in to be interviewed for purposes of uh, providing us with uh, a memoir of his uh, service to his country uh, in, during World War II. Um, Mr. Motz has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project and we're going to have a nice conversation and follow the outline that we usually follow for purposes of the Veterans History Project. So we'll begin the interview uh, with Mr. Motz and I will ask Mr. Motz, uh, Mr. Motz, when did you enter the, the service? I entered Saturday, December 6, 1941. Where were you living at that time? I was in uh, 4726 West Schubert in Chicago. So that would be around... The Diversion and Cicero. Cicero, yeah. Cicero Avenue was 4800. Diversion and Cicero. Uh, what were you doing at that time in your life? Mm, I think I worked for Chicago Road of Print at that time. So you already had completed high school? No, I had to get out of my second year. We had a large family. My dad said, you know how to read and write, you go to work. So you go to work. This was the, the depression. So every we had six people in the family. I had four was four boys, two girls, and it was depression hard for my dad to support us almost. So as soon as you're old enough, he, I was selling newspapers when I was only six, seven years old. I worked with a peddler, I, I, I in vegetables. Everybody had to work in the family. It was rough in the depression. What, what high school did you attend? For uh, this Foreman country? High School. You learned a lot there. Or? Well, I well, first I went to Lloyd School. I graduated from sixth grade. Some of the uh, what do they call semi, you know, called mid school, whatever. Yeah. I went to Kelvin Park, and it was two years. And then I was going to go to high school. I went to Lane Tech. They just opened up, and I was only about two months there. And they says, "You're out of our territory. You cannot." Uh, be here in Lane Tech. So I was transferred to Foreman High School. So I used to walk all the time. Well, Foreman High School is on Belmont and Le Claire in Laverne, about 4,900 block on, uh, on Belmont. I had walked back and forth both times. So did you enjoy, did you enjoy working for the, for that Rota? Rota Print, that's, Rota part, Print? that's uh, uh, associated with W. Hall's Printing Company. They did uh, telephone books. Well, the Rota Print, the big uh, press with big rollers, and it goes real fast. And we printed mostly catalogs for Wards and Sears, stuff like that. And it was a really rough job there, but uh, what are you going to do? Depression time. So, um... So then when the war breaks out in um, 1941 for the United States. Yeah, it was December, four, it's December 7th. <clears throat> so were you drafted or did you enlist? No, the, the, the ruling at that time was that if you once got drafted, you had to go in the Army. Well, I didn't want to go in the Army. So it was on a Saturday afternoon. I went downtown, uh, city of Chicago, by the U.S. court building, and there was a Marine in there, and he looked sharp with those dress blues. I said, I want to go, I want to join the Marines. He said, I go upstairs there and go in the Navy Department. I said, I don't want the Navy, I want to be a Marine. He said, you go with the Navy, because we don't have doctors. The Marine, the Corps, uh, the Navy takes care of the Marine. So we go up there, and you got a strip. He took a strip, and he, he marked 17 on my chest. With Mercurocomb, Mephiley, whatever you want to call it, 17. I said, what takes that for? Now, he, he marks all your papers 17. He says, that's so you're all naked, no, doctor don't one from the other. So you can't put the paper to somebody else and switch papers. They were very smart. So we had to go through six or eight, eight doctors, get examined. Then I come home that night, and we, we all talk. Our family were talkers. We talk like, oh, heck. My mom says, how come you're so quiet? You're not saying nothing. I said, I'm leaving. I said, I joined the Marines. Huh. She says, 
you can't go in the Marines. They want great big guys, not a little guy like you. I open up my shirt and see he says 17. Oh, then my mother starts crying. You're going to die. You're going to die. All the Marines, that's all you got. They do. They all die. <laughs> so what are you going to do? So you, the war broke out on uh, December 7, 41, this, this, and then at the end, next day, and then at, the and very next day, later that month, December the 30th, yeah. that's when you decided to go in, right? No, I already got in there, but they said, when do you want to leave? I said, I want to stay home the day after Christmas. Okay. I said, okay. So what day did you actually go down and sign up? I went in on December the 6th. The day before? The day before. When we were downtown celebrating with my buddies, we didn't even hear, hear about that. We were all bar hopping. One guy was in the army already, one guy just come out of boot camp in the Navy, and the people, they said, oh, they found Pearl Harbor. Oh, so what? I said, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. They said, we're at war. We didn't, we didn't know that. So you actually went in, went in before the, the, the Pearl Harbor? Before, I know it's going to be drafted, before, and I didn't want to go in the army. <laughs> So why did you know? Why did you think you would be drafted? Oh, they were drafting. Your numbers would go up in a paper. They'd, they'd, they'd uh, publish the papers. Your number when you're ready to be drafted. I was 22 years old. I'm not married or not. I was prime condition. So I knew I was going to be drafted pretty soon. My numbers were going to come up, and I didn't want to go in the army, so I joined the Marine Corps. So it, it, it seemed to you and your buddies at that time that the country was getting ready for war. Oh, yeah, we were all getting ready. They were expanding all over. It was People coming. Out there. It was coming. It was, you know, every, everybody knew that. Everybody knew that. Really? Yeah, yeah. So did, did your parents mind you just going in? No, the they didn't know. They didn't mind. They said, well, you have to go. You have to go. I said, I'm going to be called up anyway, any minute. And I was fortunate. Normally, when you're uh, east of the Mississippi, you go to Paris Island, South Carolina. They call that PI, boot camp. West of uh, the, the Mississippi, you go to San Diego. But the camps are so full, they sent me to San Diego. Thank God I went to San Diego. I went to San Diego in the Marine Corps boot camp there. Why do you say, is it easier or different? No, or? but no, the, the, the climate is all got different. Uh, it's like in the movies. And they, call, they call me a Hollywood Marine. <laughs> See, the PI Marine is, is Paris Island. And uh, if you go to San Diego, you're a Hollywood Marine. Yeah. It's like saying the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. You, you, you just a little, uh, a little something like right that. Were you the eldest son? Uh, no, I'm the baby of the family. You were the youngest. I'm the youngest. Had any of your brothers had to go my, in? No, well, my brother Art later on, he come, he went into the army. They drafted him. They were drafting everybody. He has one t uh, thumb off. He was working on a French press. He was working. Everybody had to work. He was only a kid. They'd have no guards. He put his finger in there, and the uh, thumb come off. So they couldn't. They said they couldn't use him. But later on, the army drafted him. They made him an MP up and down the coast of uh, east coast of Florida and the, back and forth. He was an MP on the trains for the even army. without a thumb. They still took yeah. him. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. It was later on, towards the end, because they were using we were using people like you wouldn't believe. Don't feel we started with hardly anybody. We wound up with ten million men in our arms. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you got into the Marines. Uh, you didn't want to go in the army. You see no. this guy looking good in his dress. Uh, oh, he looks a Marine. Oh, yeah, uh, I'll be a Marine. So, uh, um, so you were in, what inducted downtown then, and they send you by train out. Yeah, by to, train though. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first time you were out of Chicago for any length of time. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. We never traveled. No money. You have no money. You had nothing yeah. to do. Come out of the depression. <laughs> so what was uh, what was basic training like? Oh, it was it was really rough. You had to do, you go first go to the quartermaster, they throw, just throw clothes at you. I said, that's not my right size. Don't worry about it. You grow, you'll grow into it. He said, ah, the supply officer, uh, sergeant, he said, I know which size it is. That's the size you're going to have. That was it. Now we go to, uh, to uh, a boot camp. It was rough. No, you couldn't eat no pogey bait. Pogey bait is candy. You can't do this, you can't do that. You, you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, you don't go to bed at the taps at 10 o'clock. You really work right around the clock. So we're getting to the end of boot camp. I think it was 12 or 14 weeks. And I had about three more days to boot camp before we all graduate out of boot camp. And the last thing we were doing was on a firing range. So I figured uh, I, I, I shot expert. And I wanted to shoot sharpshooter. If you use sharpshooter, you get $2 more a month. That's a lot of money. You sharpshooter, you go, you, know, you get a telescopic sight and you. You're, you're special. And I was on a range. I shot expert already. I was going to shoot for sharpshooter. My rifle started going all over the place. The gunny started to grab me. He said, what's the matter with you? Hold that rifle. And he looked at me. Carmen. Carmen, come over here. He looked at me. 
You put a thermometer in your mouth, you got 104, 105 fever. You got cat fever. They call that cat fever when you get all these shots, diphtheria and tetanus and yellow fever, all kinds of shots, you have a reaction. So then they put me, the corpsman called an ambulance, I went in the hospital there in, the, in, in, in San Diego, it was just beautiful in there, all the nurses, white, nice white uniforms, all pretty, the corpsmen all white, they were all pretty. I was there for five days. I was to come down, my seat bag was, somebody packed my seat bag when the, uh, my, my platoon graduated. They all went to different places, some of infantry, infantry but, uh, motor transportation, communication, but where they all went, I don't know. I, my seat bag was up there in four other Marines. Was four, we don't know each other, but we're all boots. But they said, well, there's a truck out there. You get in the truck, you're going up to Camp Elliott. It's about 30 miles outside of San Diego. We go to Camp Elliott. We report to the first sergeant there. He's going topside. There's all the barracks at the first and second floor, you'd say, civilian life. But in the Navy and Marine Corps, first deck, upper deck. Go up the upper deck, he says, there's some officers, officers will interview, interview you guys. So we went up there, a little while, about four officers come. Oh, we jump up to attention. We're boots. We never seen anybody with a major. It was like the poop. We jump up. Oh, relax. Sit down. He's. My name is John. This is Frank. Holy God! We shook hands. You don't call an officer by his first name. So the officer says, uh, "Now let's get this straight. All of you are 21 years of age, right? Yeah. Many of you are married, right? Right. Okay. So you all going to take a physical? Take a physical." Hey, we're coming out of boot camp. We're over hard as a rock. You all got to sign papers since you volunteered. One guy said, volunteered? We didn't volunteer. The Marine Corps, you learned. You never volunteer for anything. He said, you volunteer for the Carlson Raiders. Well, the Carlson Raiders like a, we, a copy of the British commandos. Like now you go in the Navy SEALs and stuff like that. And this is a special group. We said, we didn't volunteer. He said, what do you mean you didn't volunteer? None of us volunteered. You want to volunteer? No. We turned it down. So then, he said, no, no, he's talking to you guys. They left. Then I got put in the uh, uh, 2nd Marine Division, 10th Marines Artillery. And that's in San Diego. We're training. But I'll skip that. we got a long way to go. So Did, did, you, ever, did you ever go back and retake the test to become a shot no, shooter? No, no. That's over with you. Out of boot camp, you go to the air range, you're through with that. I, I, I qualified as an expert. I got a medal for expert. That's it. Now we're training there in um, San Diego. Now they split us because they keep expanding so fast. Everybody's expanding. On. Now the war is on now. They're drafting like mad. Now they say you go to the East Coast. Now I, I train. We, we split the whole house out and then we went to the East Coast, Camp Lejeune. It's, uh, it's from North Carolina. I get there and artillery outfit there and we're training. I, I really knew artillery. I studied all kinds of books. I could get on it. Most people don't do that. I'm a reader. That's why I come to the library. I love reading. And I study everything in there. And uh, now I made corporal. And I go, oh, I'm a big shot now, boy. I'm an NCO. I'm going to be in charge of a working party instead of being in the working party. He said, get up, go up there. The first size wants to see you. Oh, I come up. I says, boy, I'm going to have my first child. Take uh, charge of somebody. First sergeant says, pack your sea bags. You're going to the Army. I said, what? I don't like the Army. I said, I'm a Marine. You go over to the Marine Corps, send you. He said, there's 33 of you all picked. I don't know how they picked these all, guys. But you're all going to Aberdeen, Maryland, the Chemical Warfare Center of the United States. They think the Japs may be using gas. And you 33 guys are going to go on a crash course up there. And oh, to the army, that they treat us like God. These guys were cooks on a train, these colored guys. They were, oh, the best cooks there were. They made liver and onions. They made anything we wanted for the Marines. Every, oh, but we had a real hard training there. We come out of there, the 33 of us, and we had special papers. Nobody can touch us. We're going to go right to, to Australia, meet the 1st Marine Division. They were coming off of Australia, off, uh, off of Guadalcanal. Now, I... From there, we graduated, we all advanced one grade, grade. Now I get to be a sergeant. Now that's unheard of in the Marine Corps. It takes you 10 years to be a sergeant. First I'm a corporal, two, three weeks later, I'm a sergeant. So, okay, now we're going to go, we, we travel by train to the West Coast. 
and oh, the ship we went on. It wasn't even an American ship, it was a Dutch ship. I didn't think you want to go into that. What was the name of the ship? No, no, don't know what the name of the ship. It was a prison ship years ago. They had the colored, they had prison uh, cages down there. That's what we slept on. It was a, a, a Dutch flag. We didn't work, to, we weren't in a, convoy, in a convoy even. So you sailed from San Francisco? Yes, oh, yeah. Was it San yeah, we're Francisco? going, yeah, going towards Australia. And this Dutch flag, you're heading for, uh, yeah. for Australia. Australia. Did you get seasick? No, but this was a, 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 a rotten ship. And we had 33 of us Marines on there. There was about 40 aircraft, I mean, uh, Air Force guys in there, about six nurses, and about four doctors. Now, this was a cargo ship, wasn't it equipped to yeah. now have almost 100 people there. Well, they only had a small galley. They only had maybe 10, 10 people on there, and, and officers, and that's it. Well, they couldn't feed us. They feed the doctors and the nurses, but we've got slop to eat, uh, hardly nothing to eat. But when we passed the equator, the party we had, holy God. When you pass the equator, you, you decide to see a polywad or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. Well, they give you a nice diploma. The guy was, one of the Dutch crew gave a nice diploma with the, the sea serpent on there. We passed the equator and so forth. And we had a party. And all the nurses, they just had a bra and their panties on there. And <laughs> they had rubber gloves, uh, surgical gloves. They filled that with uh, powder milk, and they made holes on it, and the nurses had to suck on the, on the tit of the gloves, <laughs> like, a, like on a cow. And David, uh, some of the officers, of course, made out with the nurses, whatever happened, I don't know. But we were drinking, I don't know where, we had a heck of a time. So now we landed in the Fiji Islands with this goofy ship, and they were going to wait for an American ship to take us to Australia. Now we're staying there, we had a day or two, and now all of a sudden an officer comes running to, you, you, and you, follow me. He's you're in the Carson Raiders. Oh, I said, not again, the Carson Raiders. I, I, I had sergeant says, you can't touch it. We got a letter right here from the President of the United States, because it's a rubber stamp. He says, you can't touch it. We're going to meet the, the first Marine Division in Australia, teach them chemical warfare. You can't touch it. Boy, I was glad we got out of that. We get aboard an American ship. We go to Sydney, Australia. In Sydney, Australia, we get on a train, we go to Melbourne. From Melbourne, we go down to uh, Brisbane. That's where the first Brisbane, Marine... oh yeah, in Queensland, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We go there to meet the 1st Marine Division. I'm up in the 1st Marine Division, and they says, okay, you go here, you go here, you go there. I get in a jeep, and the jeep's taking me, he says, I says, this is the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. He says, yeah. I said, what kind of outfit is that? He says, uh, infantry outfit. I'm an artillery man. So I get get there to see the first sergeant, and I yeah, I tell the first sergeant, the first sergeant, it's a mistake here. I say, I'm an artillery man. I says, he says, you go where the Marine Corps sends you. I said, where did I hear that before? I said, it don't make sense, first sergeant. I says, I'm an artillery man. I'd be more valuable to the Marine Corps in artillery. It is like putting a cook in a transportation, transportation of cook. It make sense. He says, you go where Marine Corps says you. Shut up. I said, I demand to see an officer. Oh, you want to see an officer, huh? You're smart. Are you a lawyer? I said, no. I said, I know my rights. Oh, you know your rights. Well, we don't have no officers here. So I said, I'll just a minute. Get on the phone. Sergeant Major. He calls the Sergeant Major. He says, we got a guy. I happens to be a Hollywood Marine. Now, these guys are all PI Marines, all from New York, Pennsylvania, all this stuff. And we got a smart ass here who thinks he's a lawyer. He wants to see an officer. Send him up here. I go up there, and you don't see the roughest, toughest Marine. You ever, that guy might have been 10 foot claw, tall. He might have been in the Marine Corps for 200 years. I was here, a rough guy. You, he says, don't you know you go where the Marine Corps sends you? I again, he told me that. I said, no, Sergeant Major, but he said, shut up. You know, I didn't give you permission to talk. You want to see a, a lieutenant, a, a, a officer? Yes. Hey, uh, Lieutenant. And a little kid comes here. He come out of boot camp someplace himself, a young little uh, officer. He calls me and his officer. He's coming in. He come in the officer. He said, well, you got two choices, Sergeant. My advice for you is to go back into the infantry. Second thing, you go over my head, you're going to ask for a court martial. So, <laughs> There will be five officers there. They'll all be captains and, and majors and maybe even a colonel. And they are Marine Corps from the day they were born. You lose. You will be busted from cor a sergeant to corporal, maybe private. You will never get advanced in the Marine Corps as long as you're in the Marine Corps. 
He says, you'll never get nowhere. You'll still go back in the infantry. So he says, why don't you just go back to infantry? I said, okay. I get back to the jeep driver, takes me back. And the first sergeant, he's smiling. Here. The sergeant manager already talked to him on the phone, of course. Well, well, here comes the lawyer. He says, no, I've been thinking about you. He says, I got this spot for you. You're so intelligent. He says, I'm putting you in the intelligence section. Intelligence section? I he says, yeah, you're in, I think we got a nice sergeant. There's three sergeants, Sergeant Mike, and uh, he's on special detail, and Sergeant Jesse Blondell Link. He's a southern boy. He's from South Carolina, and he don't like Yankees. And he says, you're going to be the junior sergeant, and you'll be under his control. In the meantime, he says, I got a few jobs for you. He says, we need a sergeant to take care of the mosquitoes around here. Two guys will be spraying kerosene so there's no, no mosquitoes for malaria. Then I need a sergeant for in charge of the garbage detail. Now I need a sergeant for this. He says, I got a lot of jobs for you, sergeant. He says, you're going to be so busy you won't be able to sleep. Oh, I said, what an outfit I got. Yoy, 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 yoy. Well, let's skip a lot of stuff. We go into combat. We're going to go, we went to New Britain, Guadalcanal. Not uh, New Britain, Cape Gloucester. So you never, you, they weren't utilizing your expertise in no, chemical no. warfare. It was no. when you got to Brisbane and they told you go there. Yeah, you got to go wherever they tell you. So now I'm, uh, I'm going to be the, the, the head scout. Well, that's the kiss of death. What happened to the other guy? Well, he's dead, of course. You go, you got to, they, they, they know the chaps are in there. You got to go ahead of somebody and find out where they're at, you know. But that's the kiss of death. So they even have sergeants doing that. Oh, yeah. yeah. As chief scouts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, our primary job in the intelligence section, we got to search the, the dead Japs for pictures and maps and so forth. Some of the dead guy, our Marines, too, we got to help put them in body bags. I'm so tired of putting guys in body bags, all the magnets coming out of their eyes and their nose and their mouth and all the Japs. Got to search them for all kinds of stuff. And we got to push a lot of, a lot of special details in the intelligence section. But you don't have to be smart in the intelligence section. But that's, I got good stories about that, too. But we skip along and go a little faster. But uh, you didn't mind, at this, t you, never, you never wished you had gone into the Army, though, right? No. I'm so no. glad you're in the Marine. Once a Marine, you are oh, always a Marine. Marine. All right, you're right. intelligence scout. Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. So we're in, in combat there, and uh, the, uh, we're leapfrogging. I'm going about 50 feet ahead. Another kind of guy, uh, guy comes along with me, hits on his shoulder. He goes 50 feet. And then behind us is a squad, about eight or ten men, and behind us is a platoon. We, the Japs are out there, but we don't know where they're at. The jungles are real thick. You can't see anything. So he hits me on the head, and he's going to, he walks, about, he takes about ten steps. The Japs open up. He's all loaded, but he wants to have 50 bullets in him. He lands right on top of me. Well, dead weight, when a person's dead on you, you can't move. All the blood is running on top of me. He was, I don't know how many bullets he had in him. He's blood uh, running. I can't get up. I can't move. The Japs are howling, Banzai, Banzai. And the Marines are howling, they're swearing. Pretty soon, some guy lifts the body off of me, gives me a kick in the butt. Come on, Matt, quit goofing off. Let's go. Tip of a Marine. <laughs> So what you were going for, you had like a, a, a rifle, an M1 yeah, or something? No, or, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had a carbide, but carbide, I, yeah. I, I tell you a story about a carbide, I don't like that either. So next day, next time, not the next day, but a lot of things happened in between. Uh, in the front lines, the, the, our planes are coming strafing the, the front lines. Which I'm in a, right in the right, real, real front. Yeah. All the shells are coming off, the, off the, their wings of the plane, hitting you in the helmet, feels like hail. Man, their shells are pretty thick. They're about three inches big hitting you. Man, I said, I got to get out of this outfit. There's some way I have to get out of this infantry outfit. How am I going to do that? So another time, then we're back in with the colonel. I'm with the colonel behind a great big tree with the big roots, so big, about 20 feet wide. I don't know what kind of tree it is. The colonel's there. His name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel David McDougall. And Sergeant, I mean, Major Skazlik was second in command. He's in the behind this tree. I'm there, and they're captain, and about two or three radio operators. They got these big antennas in there. We're only about 400, 500 yards behind the very front lines. The colonel is right there. Now, he was in World War I uh, tree. So he's talking to this ma the Major. I'm there because he wants me to go in the front lines, find out where the Japs are some. 
So he tells the major, he says, you know, I got a feeling, major. He says, I, I got hit in the first World War I in France. I got wounded. I had that feeling I was going to hit. And I got that feeling I'm going to get hit now. He says, if I get hit, you're going to be in command, uh, Major. Major Scotslick says, I don't want to, ma uh, Colonel, he says, I don't think I can do it. If you get hit, I want to get hit. Well, it wasn't long after that, wham, the Colonel gets hit right in the shoulder. Wow. And the Corman, Corman, the Corman comes and says, can you walk, uh, Colonel? Yeah, I can walk. He says, like, it's a bad wound there. He says, there's a hospital ship out in the bay, though. Don't take good care of you. I'll walk you back. We'll get in a jeep and take you there. So we're walking around. Fifty minutes later, wham, the major gets hit right in the jaw. He gets hit. Well, these are artillery or howitzers or? No, no they, they were in a jungle. The Japs are in front, about four or five hundred feet. So they could, the yard. they had weapons that could get you at No, four. no way. You know, so during we, when the major got hit, we says, there's a sniper, the uh -oh. Jap sniper. He's a sharpshooter, too. He got fellows a couple of times. He can see the officers giving directions, so he knows who's in charge. So when the sergeant, the major, the major gets hit, Major Scosley. Now, the funny thing, I, to get ahead of my story, I meet the sergeant major. I mean, <laughs> I hate that sergeant major. The, this major officer, he, I met him about five months later on an island. I said, Major Scoslick, I said, I taught you one state side. He said, ah, I wish I did too, but I didn't. He said, I lost eight teeth, and, the, 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 and my jaw was all reconstructed. They had wonderful doctors aboard the hospital ship. He said, they're so short of officers. We're losing officers like you wouldn't believe. Man after man after man. And that's when I seen him, you know. So I said, I got to get out of this outfit. How the devil am I going to get out of it? So a couple of days later, the guy, the, my, my men said, hey, Sarge, you better not go near the front lines. What do you mean? You're all yellow. You look like a Jap. I lost weight, too. I lost about 20 pounds. So I was getting kind of skinny. I said, what do you mean, can you? Corman, come and take a look at the sergeant. He looked at me. Come on. He said, you go back see the do doctor. I go on the back there. The doctor takes a look at me, examines me. He, he get, Corman, he says, give him a urinal. I give him a urinal. He says, urinate for me. I urinated black coffee. Black as all heck. He says, you got yellow jaundice. Oh, am I happy? I got yellow chance. I got malaria already. <laughs> Every morning gets malaria. I yelled, I said, I'm going to state side. I'm happy. No, he says. He gave you a slip. He says, you go down to the to the beach and see the the uh, the mess sergeant. You can have nothing to eat. He says, but drink juices from these big cans of peaches, pears, fruit cocktail. The cook's got to pour it all off. And the only thing you can drink is the, all those juices and sugar, whatever the heck it was. And the doctor gave me some pills. Give me four or five big pills. And uh, four or five days later, back to the front lines. In New Guinea? No, no just in Cape Gloucester. Cape Gloucester? Yeah. Well, New Guinea, too. I don't know what the devil was. But, uh, w but when the two officers got shot by the sniper, that was yeah. in Cape Gloucester? Yeah, Cape Gloucester. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's their, their real names, Colonel David McDougal and Major Scoslick. So... I said, I gotta get out of that outfit. What the devil? How can I get out of this outfit? I was gonna go stateside. No. So we go. We're going to go to another island. Uh, it's a small island, but we're in reserve. I'm the fifth marine, so the, the salt troops are either the first marines or the seventh. But the first marine division uh, it consists of the first marines, the fifth marines, third marines, and eleven marines. Eleven marines and our, our, our artillery. So we weren't the assault. We were out in the out circling around in the water on a boat before they, they call us in. And the, either the first or seven Marines were the assault troops. They went up forward. There was no resistance. They went up further and further. And all of a sudden, the Japs opened up. They let you come way in, a quarter of a mile. And the artillery, the 75 pack Howard ships, which I love, which I want, and which I trained, they put them on the beach. And of course, the Marines, the first thing to do is Joe. Joe is coffee. You always got to have coffee. The four sides get together and they're making the coffee. And, and when the Japs open up, a mortar shell hit them. The four Japs. I mean, the four sergeants. Well, I don't notice. We're out in the bay. So they call us in then. They said, well, they hit the fan. Come on in. So we come in. I see a major. I said, hey, major, the guns are all there. I said, uh, I, was, I was an artillerist. I wish I could be. I was chief of section. He said, what? He said, you're kidding me. He asked me four or five questions. And I said, he answered, boys, I was training officers when they were coming out of Quantico and artillery. I was, I was in, in, uh, in Camp Lejeune there, 
and I was a, a training officer, and I was I had my own section, which I didn't. I was only a corporal at that time, but he, he was going to know this. I had my own section. I had I was the chief of section. I was a sergeant there, and blah blah blah. He said, "What's your serial number? What's your what outfit?" You what I told him. Okay, four or five days. It was over. We it was a small island. We cleaned them all up. All of a sudden, my first sergeant says, "Hey, your buddy wants to see you." My buddy, who's that? The sergeant major. Oh, this isn't the same that guy. That big guy, yeah. Same guy. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I come, you, you scum, you, you call yourself a marine. He says, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it, but you did it. I said, what did I do? You're transferred to the 11th Marines. You're going to their artillery. Oh, the you know, major, when I gave him my serial number, he wanted me. He needed to start. Request to transfer or something here. So yeah. now my trouble first begins. You say, well, Charlie, now how come you went into artillery, now you're in artillery? You tell me what else you want. I got a report there, the 1st Battalion. Uh, the 1st Battalion is 75 howitzers, 2nd Battalion is 105 howitzers, 3rd Battalion is 105 howitzers, bigger guns. So this is the outfit that got hit, the 75, which is my specialty. I go there and I report. The captain t interviews me and talks to me. Okay, he says, uh, you go take the third gun section. There's four guns, one, two, three, four. Each gun consists of one sergeant, two corporals, and about 15, 16 enlisted men. There's about 20 in each gun, for each gun. And there's a, gun, a gunnery sergeant and a first sergeant. And he says, you take her, uh, you'd go into the, the third gun. Now, the gunnery sergeant looks at me, he's a PI Marine. First sergeant of PI Marine. All these guys were in combat together, come out of boot camp. They're all PI Marines. Now I come get the third gun section. All the men hate me. These Corporal Hughes, which would be advanced, getting the next, he, they would all be promoted to sergeant. Now Car Corporal Hughes won't be promoted to sergeant. Because I'm already a sergeant. Now all these other sergeant guys got promoted from corporals to sergeant. They hate me. My gun crew hates me. The gunning sergeant hates me. First sergeant hates me. But that's nothing. Yeah, that's it. I can take that. Don't mean nothing. You think you're in trouble? Oh, you're not in trouble yet. But I'm in kind of a lot of trouble. So they were in training. They told me what, Where are we now? Are we on? We're we're in some island training. Training. Yeah. You got you re regroup. Yeah. Stolen all your casualties and sick people and all that stuff. So we're training, and the gunny sergeant's given school, and we're all laying on a nice beautiful day, and. The machine gun sergeant is having school with the machine gun section. We're artillery. The gunnery sergeant is giving us uh, instructions on artillery and transportation, so forth and so on. And the officers are walking around, seeing that you're not goofing up. Well, goofing off. But we don't have to come to attention when the officers are there because we're in training. So this gunnery sergeant, who hates my guts, is giving school. And he doesn't see the officers, and I don't see the officers. So the gunnery sergeant says, well, say, Here's the situation. We're all set up with our guns, and around the corner on the road comes a Japanese tank. He's now we have the Hollywood sergeant tell us, what would you do, sergeant? Well, the officers are in there, and they hear this. They know something's up. They said, now what is that sergeant going to say? I got up, I said, well, Gunny Sergeant, according to Chapter 19, blah, blah, in the artillery book, I would have armor piercing, black tip uh, shells, that's armor piercing. I would do a little of that. I'd have a four-charge four, a four shell. I would blah, blah, blah. And the cat, officer all clap like, very, very good, Sergeant. Well, that made the Gunny Sergeant extra mad. Now he really hates me. It embarrassed him. And the officer, hey, very good, very, very, very good. Now we're going to go into... Now, I have a mock-up for training. We got to go aboard ship because the, uh, the Navy needs training too. We're, we're going to on a rehearsal. We know we're going to go into combat pretty soon, so we're going to go. Uh, got to climb down the nets into the boats, and a crane comes along with the artillery place piece and sets the artillery into the boat, and then we go ashore. And the beach master, ready, the na uh, naval officer there, you're in Orange Beach, Green Beach, whatever it is, and he calls you in on waves what time you come in. Infantry first, we're about the fifth or sixth wave with light artillery. So we go in, and it was a beautiful day, and we all go to shore. We're not going to shoot, though. We set the guns up and everything. And they said, break for lunch. So we break for lunch. 
emergency, emergency. Everybody board the ship right away. There's a big storm coming up. And the captain of the ship wants to get the, out in deep water. Everybody get 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 going. Because we got our boats, they, they had to drop a ramp. We rolled an artillery piece up on a on, on boat. So we're looking around, and there's a cinch. I just, uh, somebody back hard here. You break it down in a traveling position, you've got draw bars, you can pull it. We put toggle ropes, we, we, we like, you put a harness on it with a, with a line, one inch from now, about six of us, we can pull that gun all over. We don't need a truck. But a cinch is that holds it all together. The, the trail, the back trail, you break off, put it on top of the gun with shovels and axes, and you put it all together with a cinch. The cinch is like, well, like, like a, you, have, you see a, on a horse when you throw a saddle, yeah. they put that thing underneath, that's a cinch. But this cinch is about two feet, three feet wide. You put that underneath the, the gun and strap it together. And you hold the whole, whole gun together. And then you can roll it all over. Well, my cinch is missing. Well, one of my guys buried in the sand. See, my crew don't like me. So they buried, now I don't have a cinch. And everybody's hollering, get aboard the ship, get aboard the ship. The captain wants to go out in deep water. Hurry up, hurry up before the storm hits. I come out, I tie the, the, my gun together, together with these lines. We go aboard, to, uh, we get on our boat, we go uh, uh, toward the ship, and who's leaning over the rail? The gunny sergeant. What happened to you, gun number three? Where the, I, I had trouble. You had trouble. You, see, you are trouble. You not, have nothing but trouble. What happened to you now? I said, I lost my cinch. How can you lose a cinch? I know one of my guys buried. I said, I don't know, Scotty. You can't say that, though. No, I couldn't say that. I can't accuse anybody. I, I, just, I lost it. I'm responsible, right? I'm the sergeant. I'm in charge. I said, I tied the right gun together with, uh, with, uh, with the toggle lines. If that gun slips and falls apart and goes in the, in the, in the drink, uh, it sinks that boat and then you get hurt, uh, get hurt, you're going to be in the brig for 20 years. You're always in trouble. You cause trouble. The gun held together. You think that's trouble? That's no trouble. That's no. But I really get in trouble. Now this this term the Marines have of gunnery sergeant. Yeah. What does that mean, gunnery sergeant? You're an well, artillery? No. Yeah. No. First you're you're private. You got nothing. Private first class. You got one stripe. Corporal, you got two stripes. A buck sergeant, a regular sergeant, got three stripes. Now after that they call you a staff sergeant. You got one rocker. It's a platoon sergeant. The gunning sergeants get two rockers. That's your gunning sergeant. just a term for the second uh, Good. bar or it's, whatever. Yeah, Warner. underneath. So you got three stripes, and then you got a rocker here, another stripe, you know. So or, that term gunnery here. doesn't mean, doesn't, re, doesn't relate to weapons or rifles no, no. or guns. You're part, you're, you're, it's you, just you're a higher right. sergeant. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And then after that, you get the third one, is sergeant major, uh, top sergeant. I mean, it's high you can go. You don't even get uh, six stripes. A gunning sergeant is five stripes. A little guy, I'm a little guy. Most Marines are six foot six. I'm only five foot seven, five foot eight. See, I get it later on. So, they, oh, he's mad at me. So now we're going to go into combat, real combat. Now the island's going to hit us, Palu. Oh, yeah, Palu, yeah, Palu. Right here. yeah. Now that's one of the hottest uh, battles the world. But we didn't get no publicity on that because this is as good as Iowa, GM, or any of them. We lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Marines. And probably thousands and Marines. Because that's when uh, Normandy what happened in Europe. They got all the publicity and everything like that. So, okay, this, this is, they're, they're, the Navy is shelling, shelling. You think there's nobody left there. But the, the Japs are back there and there. Tell you, a really, really hot thing. So we go, go over to the nets, come back into the boats. I got my boat. I got a lieutenant, the first lieutenant. Barnes with me. He's the executive officer. He's going to lay the battery with an instrument like a sort of survey, surveyor's instrument that lays the battery. You just don't shoot any way you want. Artillery is very complicated, very complicated. And he, he's with my, my boat. He's in charge. And their officers in their boat, we spread our officers apart so you don't, they jab sink the boat, you don't lose all your officers. So we're in a, in a track, uh, Amtrak. It looks like a tank, but it's empty. And it's got a ramp. You the ramp falls down, you roll the artillery piece right off. See? So you got these two tracks that are going around. So we're in there waiting, going around, circle to circle, waiting to be called in. Then all of a sudden they said, okay, get ready, stand by, you're going to go in. But then we start going in a circle, and the lieutenant says to the, to the guy driving, driving his amp, I think he's a, a Marine, a young Marine, young kid, 
and he's crying. He said, what the hell are you crying? I was in the, one of the first waves. He said, the Marines are all over. They're dead. They're, they're, we ran over all the bodies. There's hundreds of them laying all over. He's crying and crying, you know. So I said, oh, that was him, you know. Uh, so the lieutenant said, come on, let's go. And we're going to the circle. He says, I can't. One of the tracks are stuck. He said, I can only one one track, then you go in the circle, right? You got two, t two yeah. treads going around. So we're going around and around. And the lieutenant says, well, I've got to go in. He called another boat over. He says, I'm going to jump into this other boat with the aiming circle. I, I can lay the battery down. He said, okay, Sergeant, you're in charge of the boat. I said, oh, thank you. He called the boat, those an Amtrak, okay? So we're there going around and around. Like, Come on, I said, look at this thing going. Well, along comes a Navy cruiser. No, on the side now. We're on the right flank of the combat, of the beach. Very right flank. And behind a little hill comes a Japanese tank, a light tank with a, like a 37 millimeter. And he'd come, boom, boom, boom. He throw two or three shots, and he go hide behind the hill. Now, see, when you're behind a hill, the Navy can shoot this way. They can't get behind the hill. They, they can't hit it. They lob, yeah. So he'd shoot. Well, you'd think he's shooting at you, but there's so many boats out there shooting at anything he wants. Then he goes behind the hill. But his cruiser comes along, they lowered the five inch guns. And they, on, on the bullhorn, they said, Get that thing out of the way. When we shoot, we're gonna, that jet comes out, we're going to blast him out of the water. And water uh, shoot him, we're going to, you'll be, once the blast going to blast, blast you guys out of the water. You get that thing out of the way. That oh, both tracks went boom, real fast. You're on the edge of the beach, right? No, we're on the, on the water. You're I'm, still in the water. Oh, we're on the, in the, yeah. water, on the water. Shallow yeah. water. Yeah, fairly shallow. But. Not, it's not, not both tracks are working. I thought, what's the matter with you? And I said, there's nothing wrong with that track. I took my rifle and put him in the back of the head there, and my gun sight cut his head. I said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a coward. Get it in. I said, if not, I'm going to pull your head off. I'll take the track in. I said, they need help right now. Oh, they were just hitting us. They were killing us, you know. And then he's okay. I said, get us in. I don't care. You take this airboat to New York. I said, but you're getting us now. The Marines want us now. They need firepower. So then we get in. So the, I, the guy was, was chicken? Yeah, he was goofing off. He was so frightened. But seeing all of that Marine, he cracked up. He was, he was a basket case. So we come in on the beach. He was waiting for me. The gunny sergeant. I said, I had trouble. Oh, he says, you're always in trouble. You cause trouble. Well, now what's your excuse? I said, you got to ask Lieutenant Barnes. I said, this guy, I ain't going to ask Lieutenant Barnes. He's your trouble. You come and bring your gun and put the gun right there. I said, Gunny, I'd like to have my gun over there. It's a better position. He's just, he's spit. You see what that spit is? You put that gun right there, I'll shoot you. You're in an combat condition. You do what I tell you. He said, you put that gun right there. It's not a good, it was all quarrel. I called guy, take out, I actually cut off, to recoil the gun. You're, you're going to fly back. I said, get some sand. You had to get sandbags. Put some sand in there. Two guys lay on a rear, rear trail, so we shoot off. The gun don't roll all over. You can't bite into the coral. Coral's hard as heck, you know. So we're shooting, he says, you charge one. In the shell, there's a charge one, two, three, four. Powder bags about big as your fist. It's semi-fixed ammunition. You, you got the shell here, and the, the number one ba bag is tied to the, bottom, the primer. Primer, And you got charge two, three, four. You got, this gun shoots about three miles. A 105 shoots about five miles. So the jabs were so close, we were, we, we were shooting charge one only. So you take four, three, and two out, it's on a spring. You rip them, they're stamped for it. You rip it off and throw that powder on the side, put the projector in there, and the gun is ready. You throw the gun and the, the shell, projector, and everything into the gun. And you shoot, uh, charge one. Well, we were shooting for well, well, two hours. Now, according to manual, there's about the rate, the army says, the rate, the rapid fire is six rounds per minute. We were throwing off 15 and 20 rounds a minute. Wow. The Jets thought we had automatic artillery. Oh, the gun never got a recall. Here, instead of going back with the recall, it stayed here. We were shooting. When well, we broke up the attack, broke them up. And, uh, did, we the, had, did the cruiser ever knock out the light tank? No, I don't know. I don't know. I'm you sure. Know, the, the guy that wanted you to. I don't know. Uh, I, we're gone. I don't know. Yeah, what happened that. after that? That, yeah. that, that don't mean it. So now we're, we're, we've got a break there. And the gunny sergeant comes around. He says, take all, all your powder. We got a lot of powder, three, four, and five power bags, and you four guns. Take them all together, put them in sandbags, and throw them in, in this gun emplacement, which is maybe 20 feet away from my gun. See? And we kept throwing sacks, gunny sacks full of powder into that sack. But it started taking off. We didn't examine it, you know. 
it's uh, there's, there's fire inside that, in the, that gun, Japanese gun position. And the admiral and the uh, admiral and the general and the in the uh, uh, out there on the ship, they could see it from the shore with their binoculars. They said, well, did, you, did you hit a uh, ammo dump? I hit one of our ammo dump. It started going off all over. Fireworks all over. I took my gun sights off. I said, hit the deck. I took the gun sights off the gun so they wouldn't uh, not happen to that. That's optical, you know. And we all took off, took off, and lay down. And then the beach master come running up to me, and the gunner sergeant was there. And the beach, beach officer says, what happened there? I says, well, sir, I says, uh, there must have been some Japanese ammo in there. I said, the infantry was supposed to check that out, but evidently, evidently they didn't do that, and we didn't have no time. I said, that was a Japanese ammo, ammo dump. It was all our powder. Now, the gunning sergeant was there. I could have nailed him to the cross. and said, he told us to do this. He would have an investigation, see. And then that, that battle was over with, and, and they recommended the first gunny sergeant, the first sergeant, to go stateside. They were long, they, they were long enough. Who they recommend for a gunny sergeant? Third gun, Charles Matz, gunny sergeant. About three weeks later, I get a promotion come down, platoon sergeant, one rocker. Three weeks later, another promotion come down, gunny sergeant. I made gunny sergeant. You think I got my, you know, enough trouble? Yeah, I can have more trouble than that. <laughs> now I get the begunny sergeant. Oh, they got. You never heard of, of anything you want in the whole world, begunny sergeant. I'm in charge of 80 men and my, almost 100 men because the guns, machine gun section underneath my control too. But I, I get the four guns, the machine gun section. I have machine gun sergeant. You take care of your own. I tell them I want a gun here, a machine gun here and there to protect us because we're busy with artillery. They got here. Jeff break two or something like that, the machine gun section got to protect us. You know, that's the way it works. And then, uh, it, 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 it's really funny. So you were, when you were on Okinawa then, you were there. No, the, yeah, later on. Yeah. Now we're going up the over, uh, yeah. later on, a little later on <laughs> in the story. Too long? No, to... <laughs> this is wonderful. I, were you able to write home at all during this time? I, I wrote very little, very little. See, I, I, I talked to a lot of Marines, and they said it's incredible that what you went through, what, this is only a tip of the iceberg, what I'm telling you now. He says, we know BS artists when we see one. And these guys know when you're shooting a breeze, when you're lying like hell, when you aren't. They say, how can you do all that? All these different things you do. It's unbelievable. You don't know all the things that went in between there. Oh, I could tell you stories. You wouldn't believe. You'd laugh like hell. Laying in a grave strand singing. And we were in, in South Carolina, North Carolina. We were on, on, on just on, just on weekend, you know. Well, we were drinking this stateside when I was still the stateside. It was like 42 or 41? Yeah, something yeah, like 42, that. Yeah, 42, yeah. Well, we were drinking. You couldn't get no whiskey, but you get wine and beer. Well, we are pretty well loaded. Well, we are a small little town. Every little town's got a cemetery, right? So we go in the cemetery, and each one of us lay on top of a gra grave. We started singing the Marine Corps hymn, and we we're all half drunk. You know? <laughs> well, the locals don't really like that. You no, know? I would imagine. But they not. think the world of the Marines. Oh, they got the Marines. Are, the Marines are everything. So they take, take and they lock us up. Well, we could have got busted there, you know, for doing that. But these guys like this. But they, they said, "You guys sober up. You sober up." They took us to the USO. They pressed and cleaned our uniforms up. We washed up and shaved and everything. That was the only real, real trouble I had was. There, I thought I was going to be busted for sure, but they really liked this. Same thing happened in Australia. When I was in Australia, we, me and this other Marine, those they had double deck buses in Australia. Yeah, I loved Australia. Oh, the people, they they, they loved you. They loved you. Yeah, I used to, well, MacArthur stopped the Japs, right? Yeah, and yeah. oh, sure. And we were there, and me and this other Marine, we were on this double deck. They had taxi cabs and buses. They ran by charcoal. I don't know how they did that. There was, in, in the trunks, they had charcoal. And they don't gasoline. And how they did it, I don't know. Well, we can't do that now. But we're on this bus, and we kicked everybody else off the bus, just my other Marine and I. He drove, he had his girl down there. I was on the top deck with my girl. And we were, drove out in the country. And I was carrying my girl down the, the steps, the winding steps from the top deck on, down in the bus, you know. They have the England, the double deck buses. And a little smaller scale, though. And I fell, and I cut my, my, my knees, my pants, and everything else. Well, we ran out of gas. We were out in the country someplace. I don't know where we were at. Some small, we don't know. We were drunk, you know. 
So the town people took us in. Come on, Yanks, take your pants off. They sewed our pants, pressed our clothes. They did everything for us. Oh, were they nice. Oh, the nicest people in the world. Oh, I really like that. Australia was, was good. Enough. They had steak and eggs. They, and they had little round cups. You put the egg in. It had to be perfect. It runs out, they throw the egg away. Two nice eggs right on top of a steak. Steak and eggs. Everything is steak and eggs. Steak and eggs. Uh, un unbelievable. Now, they were short of men, the young girls were. They were younger, human. They were getting heat and heat. You could go downtown, and they thought the world of Marines. You go downtown, you see two girls coming on and say, I want you. I says, I want you. She drops her two girlfriends, and she goes with you. I come home with her. She takes me upstairs. Up. We go in her bedroom. The next morning, her mother knocks on the door. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Yank. Holy Christ, I'm in bed with her. She says, what would you like to have for breakfast? Yeah, they, 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 what, the young girls, they know they want to get married to somebody. And the Yank, it was a good thing. They go stateside. And I got in good with her. I bought own uh, PX and got her a box of lollies. Lollies in Australia is candy. Yeah. And I got the old man carton of cigarettes. I never smoked in my life. I bought the cigarettes. I was in with the family there, man. The old man with the cigarettes, the old lady with her candy, and I had the young girl. Oh, it was, Australia was, was, was nice. Was that around Melbourne? Or? Well, right, right, right outside of Brisbane. Uh, outside of Brisbane, yeah, yeah. Queensland, yeah. 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 But, oh, I liked Australia. It was it was really wonderful. All the stuff we happened. I, I can tell you stories that... Did uh, you stay in touch with that girl? Did you write to her or anything? No, no. no. Yeah. Marines, we got, we got a girl to report. <laughs> yeah. So there were some good times in there. You, oh, you just yeah. Worried, oh, oh, yeah. It wasn't... Uh, Anyway, when I kind of was on boot camp, I got in trouble in boot camp, too. I'm also in trouble, see. So I, I, they came and put me on MP, on uh, kitchen duty, KP, not P, KP. And they, I got an officer's quarters for being a, a mess duty, a mess, which is the best duty you can get. Because the officers only don't have no, no breakfast. They're at home with their wives. Yeah. yeah. I just change this sign here on the back of Okay. See, the officers, they only have, like, lunch. It's supper time, they all go home again. You only got a few officers, so we had it easy. And on, uh, you have an office inspection on a Friday. This is stateside yet. We're still, still training and everything else. The war is on, of course, but you get your Saturdays and Sundays off. And then the head sar mess sergeant would say, I'm leaving to Long Beach. I'll take three guys with me. You just got to give me five dollars. Now that was a lot of money. Those guys, they spent all the money in cigarettes and gambling. I didn't do that. And he says, "You go with me. We leave right after inspection on Friday, and you got we got to be back here Monday morning on roll call, six o'clock. You miss, you miss your AWOL." He says, "But I want five dollars a head. You make five dollars a head on each one of us." Then we open the trunk. He put big hams, big lines of pork. He was stealing the stuff out of the mess hall. Sell them to the civilians, to the restaurants. So this guy had it. He had a thing going. All these guys got a thing going. That's the way it is in the service. One hand washes the other. So he made money with all the food he brought in there, and, and then we each give him five dollars. That was fifty dollars. A lot of money, you know. And I was ready to go home one time. It was on a weekend. Uh, we had it was about second or third week there. I had mass duty for uh, uh, six six weeks, something like that. I got penalized for that. And I met a nice girl. I picked her up. I put her in a hotel room. And I said, i got to leave now. And I said, I'll pick you up next week. But when I come back next week, I don't know where she, what hotel I put her in. Her. She might have took off, too. I mean, she might be a, a whore, too. I don't know. But she took off. I couldn't find a hotel or anything. I paid money ahead of her for a room. I said, here you are, honey. I thought she was a poor girl, you know, all that stuff. And I could never find her. I yeah. never found that girl that, in Long Beach. So that weekend that you were out with that uh, officer, and they were he was giving, selling uh, army food to the restaurants, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what did you do that weekend that was so great? Why did he want to, what did he take for your, why, what well, was, it was, uh, it was good. to get off base or something and go on a trip? Or? Because in Long Beach, I could go to the bar, I'm a young kid, and I take a shot of booze, and all these army guys, sergeants, and army guys, they were 30, 40 years old. They're old guys. And they're, they're dripping out of their mouth for their booze. But they can't have that. The, the army general says, no hard liquor to the army. But he's no code in the Marines and the Navy. See? 
and uh, an MP to get him. So I'd take the shot, just aggravate the hell out of him. This is in Long Beach, California? Yeah, in Long Beach, yeah. yeah. I'd take a shot of booze and the trail around there. This and these guys, their tongues are hanging out. And this and that to aggravate the hell out of these guys. I'm telling you, it's just one of those things, you know. I just like, I like Long Beach. It was real good, you know. Then I, I did got a hold of another girl, girl. yeah, because a woman, she actually, and she could tell by my haircut. I had white walls, you know. They give you a real short haircut when you come out of boot camp. And I'm, I think just before I, before this here, I'm going to just, she gets me, she says, my husband's a Marine, he went overseas, and he's from Guadalcanal, where he was. And she says, I'm lonely, would you be my boyfriend? She says, I know you've got to be clean. You got to be clean and so forth. Yeah. She says because you had a boot camp, you have no disease and nothing like that. So I had a shack up job there. So, so that's the way it is. The war, war does strange things to you. All strange things to you. See, where are we at now? Uh, Paleo? Yeah, we come. We're back now we're getting ready for uh, for Okinawa. Okinawa later on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we go. Now I'm the gunny sergeant. We're training. We go to Guadalcanal quite often. We shoot up in the hills because it's pretty hard, nice practice for the artillery, shoot up in the hills, you know. And we go up there and we go in convoy and they say, fire mission. Then we break apart A battery, B battery, and C battery. And A battery was always first. And my captain, I was a federalist cap. Hey, my gunny sergeant, I trade my guys good. Then the other guys, they holler, well, A battery's in first line, that's why. So the colonel said, right, to be fair, I put A battery in the back, of the back. I have B battery, C battery, and A battery when we go in convoy. We vote for mission. A battery is ready to fire. They're cheating. The other officers stay at, at their meeting, though. Know. They says, the colonel says, all right, I'll have an officer from B battery, an officer from C battery, go to A battery, and see when you got ready to fire mission, you got a gun, the sight's got to be in there, you got to be ready to throw a shell in there. You're all ready, position. See, you guys are cheating, you're not ready. So he says, have an officer B battery, C battery, Check a battery. See if they have, when they say they're ready to fire, that they're not cheating. Okay. They checked us up. We were ready to fire. Oh, my cap. Hey, I got a good gunny sergeant. I got a good gunny sergeant. They are hard. Then we're, we were shooting one time, practicing, and uh, all of a sudden our runner comes over, and no, no officer comes over from C battery. He says, Can I borrow your, your gunny sergeant to my captain? He said, what for? You got your own gunny sergeant now. No, no we got a problem, he says. We got a, a round, hot round, stuck in the gun. See, it's semi-fixed uh, ammunition. Projectors here, the shell here. When you, when you open the breech, you throw it in, there's lands and grooves there, you know, to a, to a smooth thing like a shotgun is smooth, a mortar is smooth, but a rifle, you got uh, rifle, lands and grooves. That's what gives you accuracy in your distance, see. When That's he, in a howitzer? or a, uh, This is a howitzer. Yeah. All, all good artillery. Yeah. That. So when the guy threw it in, the projector come out of the shell, and it got caught in the lands and grooves, and it couldn't get it out, see. And they says, your, your, your gunny thighs are supposed to be real good. I said, but you got Sergeant Young, he, Gunny Sergeant Young. He said, my buddy. We're buddy uh, Gunny, we all stick together. Gunny Sergeant First Sergeant, everybody stick together, you know. I said, he's a very good, he's my friend. No, he says, he can't get it out. He don't know how to do that. And we don't we want to go to all the trouble with the vision, I mean, be an investigation. We want to keep it among ourselves. Can your sergeant take care of it? My captain said, what do you say about Gunny? Yeah, yeah, I'll take a crack at it. So I said, I want two volunteers. I had two volunteers. Mex a little Mexican, Martinez. All Mexicans are named Martinez. <laughs> a little skinny little kid. And then Pop Ponders. Now, he was an old guy. He was been at least 38 years old. He had three or four kids. I got a Marine Corps, I don't know. We call him Pop. Pop Ponders. Ponder. Ponders. He says, I'll volunteer. I had two volunteers. I said, okay. I took a fire axe and I got a, a big tent pole, an eight man pen tent pole, about three inches big. I took that and threw that in the Jeep. We went over there. I opened the elevator the gun, I put the, the flag, at the, the, the tent pole down in there. I said, Martinez, you catch the shell. Okay, I opened the breach, you catch what, uh, the, uh, the projector. He said, won't go boom? I said, it won't go boom. You sure you don't go boom, Mr. Sergeant. I said, I know, Mr. Sergeant. I said, catch the goddamn thing, shut up. And I said, pop. And I come with the axe and I hit the thing, you know. 
The lieutenant came running over from Seabed. What are you doing, Gunny? That gonna fall off. You're gonna blow God damn thing gun apart. You're gonna die and there'd be such an investigation. Oh my we got more trouble we started with. I said, Lieutenant, you asked me to help you and well, give me one more crack at it. I says, Get out of here, get out of the area. This the trio trio. I said, Pop, pop, you're now holding it firm against the tip of the shell a projector. Hold it firm. I'm going to whack the hell with the fire axe. Martinez, catch that. It's going to go boom. I said, shut up. It ain't going to go boom. I hit that sucker as hard as I could. It come out. He caught it. I said, Martinez, hold that in your left. Pop, take my Jeep. Go to the shore. Go as far in the water as you can. And throw the projector all the way out, as far as you can. I said, Lieutenant, write in your report that you shot that shell. Nobody will know it. That night, there was a quart of booze on my tent. Compliments of sea battery. I called my sergeant together, my first sergeant, a platoon sergeant. We all had the bottle swung around two or three times. So how did you know how to, to get that projectile Well, that's what, that, that's what the officer asked me. He said, how, why didn't it go off? I said, well, if you study your, your, your artillery, your, 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 they're hoping the woman who made the artillery piece made it right. See, there's safety factors in there. You got the cone and you got a wrench. You, most of it is, you don't have to touch it. When you hit it, in the shell, then it goes off. But you don't have delayed action. You set the, set the timer where it goes, penetrates, say in a big bunker, then goes in three or four feet, and then it explodes. Or you can time it, air burst, you know, and then it bursts up there and, and, and shell, the projector breaks apart. But I never used that. It's hard to do it. You got to know the humidity, the air current, the, the but hitting hitting it directly on the nose no, like no, that. No, no, I've come to that. Yeah, I said, you know, if you know your your artillery, I says the way it works, it, you hit the tip, it goes through a, a channel, and it goes through another channel, it hits the main thing, and then it explodes. I says, but the way safety factor, centrifugal force, you gotta the channels are are all different way, one one this way and this way. But when the gun goes off, the centrifugal force lines that both the, the path goes right through. So it can from here to here. Otherwise it's like this. So if you hit this, it won't go off. But the centrifugal force has got to go three and a half times out of the artillery piece before it goes off. So if you can hold your gun your hand in front of the artillery piece, it shouldn't go off. Six feet should go off. It's a safety factor. It's built into the, it's every artillery piece. It's very in there. But the officers don't study all that stuff. Maybe they read it fast. He don't know understand. But I, I, I say I always read. So, but if Martinez hadn't caught the shell, would he have gone off? No, then? still wouldn't. Have. Because you need a centrifugal force to line these two two things up. See, a channel goes here and a channel here. These line, these channels got to be lined up. So the centrifugal force makes it brings this one over. And so that then, triggers it off. Then, then, then it goes from here to here to the main charge, and then it blows up. So if you just knock it back out, yeah. there's no centrifugal force no, to. No. You gotta have that. You see, theoretically, you're supposed to have a bell. They call it a bell that fits over the nose, so you don't hit the nose. But nobody has a bell. Maybe the vision's got it. But then we'd have to ask the vision to be investigation. That's what the officer didn't want. They wanted to keep it in the house. We wanted to keep it among ourselves. Well, the, nobody so, had a bell. So this was. I was just taking. I guess I was just gambling. Yeah. If they didn't make it right, we all. Would so be if there wasn't. But, but did this happen very often? In this no, case? it was very, very, very rare. rare. So then. No, the officer know not about. They don't. They don't even know what to do. So, so it means like it's um, somebody made a mistake or. No. It just happened. No, did what happened is when the guy threw the shell, the projector, and he supposed to put it all together, but he had the, the the brass shell with the powder, the big powder, to throw the projector in his hand, and the projector, the, the top of the bullet, that goes in, and the casing is here. Well, that's up in the gun, but he's got the shell here. See, it's separated. He didn't load it right. No, well, he, he threw it too hard, the shell come out of, the projector come out of the casing into the gun, and it locked itself into the lands and the grooves. It couldn't get it out. You'd elevate the gun, it wouldn't fall out. So he had to pound it out. And the only way you could do it is pound it out. But see, I spread the artillery real good, and I figured if it was made right, no matter how hard I hit it, it would and be a fizzle. But the two, two things have to be lined up. Physical force aligned the two uh, channels together and make the charge go off. See, wow. I didn't know that. See, see. What kind of whiskey was it? <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> kind of whiskey it was. It was good whiskey. Yeah. It was always that way. Yeah. Oh. The last thing I know, when one of the other captains says, Gunny, what am I going to do with you? That'd be the end of my story. That comes later on in Okinawa. <laughs> yeah. But this, uh, this is the thing that happened to me. Now we're going to, we're, we're in training, 
we're going to go go to Okinawa. But well, we don't know it's Okinawa yet, you know. We know we're going to blitz, but we, we don't know it's Okinawa. It's, uh, it's touch hush. And uh, we're, after five, uh, after chow, you do what you want. We're resting and everything. Every guy visits his cousin in a different battery or a different company, and you go to the movie. Some guys want to do this. You want to go to the beach and swim. Do whatever you want, you know, after that. So everything's scattered all over. There ain't five guys in my camp, you know. So I'm, I was going to go to the theater. I want to see, watch the movie. They got all the coconut trees, you know, big layers of men going all the way up watching the movies. And uh, a runner comes up to me, and he says, uh, Gunny, uh, Major Moffat wants you. Major Moffat. He's from Chicago and from Lawrence Avenue and Broadway. He's a broker, a millionaire. He's a real, oh, nice Marine. He hates officers. He loves the infant, uh, enlisted men. He loves in, uh, enlisted men. He hates officers. All officers are afraid of this guy. He's a big royal guy, and he's a nice officer, a real, real Marine officer. He's a Marine officer. He calls me, he says, Gunny, he says, I want you to get 80, 80 men in 20 minutes. He says, there'll be 20 trucks out there. I want you to get those 20 men out there right now. He says, I says, Major, I can't do that. I don't have no 80 men in the camp. I got five men. And these other men, they tell me, go to hell. I grab this guy and I grab, go after another guy. Just say, we're going to run, run away. I wouldn't know anybody. How can I get 80 men? He says, come to attention. Come to attention. Now he says, I gave you a direct order. What do you say, sir? What do you say, Gunny? Aye, aye, sir. That's better. Relax. I'll give you the situation. He says, there's an LST coming in. And he says, we need supplies. You know we're going to, uh, in, uh, in, in combat. There's no secret. Next three or four days, we're going to leave. And we need this supply. It's very vital that we get the supplies. And he's coming in at high tide. He, he drops the ramp. LST is a big ship. He opens up the bow of the thing and drops a ramp. He's got to empty that thing right away in two hours because the tide goes out. And that ship's got to pull off of the shore. And that ship is needed. It's very essential. See, so we've got two things. The captain's got to get that ship off, and you've got to empty that thing. And he says, you've got two hours time maximum before the tide changes. I says, well, he, you know, we, I, 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 it's like better, you know. He says, I gave you an order, Gunny. What do you, you said? I, what did you say? I, I sir. He says, do it. I says, permission to talk. Talk. Have I got your permission, Major, to mention your name? Have I got your backing? You got my backing exactly. My ring is three two two. See, you got the telephone. You ring it three times, two times. That was his phone. Three two two. You tell any officer gives you a hard time to call me, and you tell them I'm in a very, very bad mood. Major now, Patrick. what would you do? Yeah. See? Well, I think I'm. I'm fast on my feet. I go down to the theater. I said, where's the old D, the officer today? He's back there. The captain's over there. I come, oh, captain. Uh, he says, what do you want, Gunny? I says, I like about 15 or 16 of your N MPs. He says, who the hell do you think you are? Because you're a Gunny Sergeant? He says, you come out of the and you say you want 15 or 16 MPs. Let me explain to you, the captain. I said, Major Moffat, when I mention his name, oh, him, yeah, that's him. I said, there's a ship coming in, and uh, in, in, Captain, and we got to load that thing. I need 80 men. I said, and where, how am I going to 80 men? They said, they're right out there. I said, I want 15 or 16 of your MPs, take one section, and all these guys are marched to the road where those 26 start pulling up already. I said, everybody goes, corporals, sergeants, everybody but staff and NCOs. Gunny sergeant, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, they don't have to go. But everybody's a working party. I don't care who the hell, like corporals or sergeants. I said, and the MP's got to guard them so they don't run away. So, well, very good. Okay, I'll do that. I always call it Major Moffat. I don't have nothing to do with him. So, so you get the MP's, the whole section come over here, 80 men. Come in. I said, hang around there till you guys are in a truck. We go get on, on the truck, the MP's. Okay, then we took off. We went to the ship. We unloaded it at the end of the, end of the two hours. Who comes in a jeep? Major Moffat. Now, this is the kind of officer he is. He looked at me, Gunny, very, very good. Call all the men around here. Come all the way around. He said, hey, men, there's ice cold beer in the jeep. Every man gets two cans of beer. That's the kind of officer he was. 
Major Moffat. I don't know what happened to him. He was one heck of a guy, officer. Unbelievable what this guy was. Boy, I could have worshipped that guy. He was a real Marine Corps officer. I ran and the uh, rotten officers. Uh, now, we were getting ready to go. We hit Okinawa. I think it was April the 1st, April Fool's Day, Easter Sunday. It hit Okinawa. It was just, we walked in, there was no nothing in there. But later on, it really hit the fan. Now, we had, they took the 75 Howards away from us because we were going to bigger islands, Japan itself. They are suicidal. We knew we were going to lose thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. They gave us 105 instead of uh, 75 Howards. So we're in training in there. So we're training in there, and uh, we got to fill in with our casualties, too. So we got this new first lieutenant. Was he a nice guy? You ever see a movie, Tyrone Powell? And he's a, and a real... He sh brought his picture. He was originally on Guadalcanal. He got wounded. He went stateside, and he got married. He brought us pictures of his wedding, where all the officers got all their swords across, you know, he come out of church. A beautiful bride. He got a dress blues. Was he a handsome guy? A first lieutenant. He was only with us three days. He was... He was we really liked that guy. So this is, this is in, on, 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 yeah, on Okinawa, and we were just doing nothing, nothing important, just shoot shell here and there to keep the Japs off track. And him and the first sergeant was walking around the perimeter. Now, the first sergeant was a tall guy. He was like 6'2", 6'3". And his officer was another real tall guy. Now, we had the, aura, the, uh, the notice came out that the Japs were in infiltrating our lines. They, had, they were dressed like gooks, we call them the natives, gooks. And they would have satchels of explosives, just like these suicide stuff. Yes, had that in World War, World War II. They'd fight where the where, uh, headquarters were, would the officer, they'd run in there and blow up the whole place. So he said, look out for, the, for these Japs, because they're posing as, as, as civilians, and they're dressed like them and everything else. So he was new. We had a lot of other new guys. And this young kid was on the machine gun section. A young kid, 17, 18 years old, came out of the boot camp only. We, we, we needed people like you wouldn't believe. We, how people we were losing like heck. And the first sergeant and, and the officers looking around, checking to the perimeter, okay? And it was a bright day, bright moon, August day. Like you read a book almost by it, it was so bright. And this kid said, halt, who goes there? Well, the, the first sergeant heard a click. He pulled the, he pulled the, the, the kid, he got a chamber and the machine gun. And he hit the deck. The, the new officer didn't. The kid opened up. Brrrm, about eight or ten bolts right across the uh, first lieutenant's body. He was dead before he hit the ground. Friendly fire. Yeah. Well, the kid, he should have said, he said, what's the password? He should have waited for the password. But he hit the gun right away. And the first time he hit the deck, he fell and he went down right away. And, but the officer didn't. He was going to say, how are the password? And the kid opened up. He killed our first officer. We had him three days. That's how long he lasted. Beautiful guy you ever seen. Poster. Marine Corps picture, that would be him. Oh, what a guy. Three days. Three days. Unbelievable. Holy God. Now we're going to get, uh, we get new officers. Now, uh, our battalion rates only a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant a Major's got a gold oak leaf. Uh, lieutenant Colonel's got a silver oak leaf. A full colonel got an uh, eagle. Eagle. He's entitled to four stripes like a Navy captain. He got four stripes on his sleeve. But our guy then after Colonel comes a general, Brigadier General, Major General, Lieutenant General, full general. So this guy comes in, we get a new officer, he's a full general a colonel. Oh boy. These are our officers are all excited. They're all apple apple polishers. They all want to kiss uh, his ass all the time. They all kinda of get next to the, the, the senior. Our new, our new commanding officer. He's a full colonel. Holy God! So he wants to have inspection to check his group, his new men, right? Naturally. So we got our seat bags in the meantime. I didn't see my seat bag, but everything's in there. Six months or a year, I think. I didn't see that. Now we had army cots. We never had army cots. Or anything. But the war was over in Europe now. See, they're doing June, and now we're getting all the supplies from the army. The Marine Corps gets nothing. We get what Patty shot at, you know. And so. I call on my sergeant to get our, I said, we're going to have inspection, the colonel's going to inspect all of us. So I said, I got a good idea. 
in your seat bag, you got uh, you had shoe polish. I said, we're going to polish your shoes and take your khaki because we were at the, uh, the Battle of the Greens. Uh, we're going to have khaki. The Army had that. That was the dress for the day for inspection. I said, take your khaki, put it in your cot and your blanket and kind of press them, sleep on them, and press the khaki pretty good and polish the shoes. So the next day, the inspection in there. The colonel's going to see battery. A B battery comes around to us, sees A battery. All my sides and I wear polished shoes, and I'm there and my current sides and the first sides. We're all there. Oh, very, very good, A battery. Very good. Holy God. Yeah. This captain, I call him the spitter. I hate this guy. He comes, the, the runner comes, the captain wants to see you. He is mad. He's spitting. Well, he's spitting. He's mad. Because he was a nerd. He got red in the face. He's spitting. He's this kind of a person. Very nervous guy. He come in there. Gunny, whose smart idea was that to polish your shoes and dress up like you're in a... You, where's your, didn't you have the dress blues too? What's the matter with you? I said, what did I do? He said, you don't know what you did. What did I do? I said, didn't the colonel say it was nice? Yeah, but you made us officers look like asses. We've got all wrinkled clothes, dirty combat boots, and you guys are standing like you're on a parade. He's, you embarrass an officer. You don't embarrass an officer. What am I going to do with you, Gunny? What am I going to do with you? He's spitting all over. Yeah, big deal. Oh, that one. We go over uh, lunch. The runner comes to my tent. Gunny, go up to officer's country. Captain wants to see you. He's mad. He's spitting all over. Yeah. Ah. Okay. I, I go up in the country. Uh, up to his tent in the officer's country. He's come on. We're going to see the colonel. Oh, he ran me up. He's going to bust me. Clare Marshall. That chicken guy. What the hell's the matter with him? For a little thing like that, he's going to get mad at me. You come on. We're going to see the colonel. He's mad. I come and see the colonel. He's uh, colonel. He's a, this is the gunny sergeant that we're talking about. The other officers, you know. Oh, very good, uh, Gunny, this colonel says. Very glad to meet you, uh, Gunny. He says, I want to get something straight. He's now, he says, I don't know artillery. And uh, I want to know when I'm running something, I want to know about it. He's a good officer. He says, I was a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft officer all my time in the, car, in the Marine Corps. So he said, I know a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft, but I don't know artillery. So I told him, I said, where could I learn it? I only got two or three hours for this. I got to know all my officers, my supplies, and there's a lot of red tape he's got to go through. And he said, I don't want to have embarrassment in front of the men or anything else. Can we have something? What would you suggest between you and me? And he said, I said, well, he's take the gloves off now. Tell me what you want, uh, Gunny. I says, I'll have a gun hooked up, and you and I will go out in the boondocks. And I says, if it's you and me, we'll send the truck driver away. Very good. So he hooked a gun up to a truck, or pulled a gun out there. I told the truck driver, pick us up in two hours. Get out of here. You get out of here. Then the colonel says, take your shirt off, sergeant. I took my shirt off. Yeah, I take my shirt off. Says, your stripes are off. My eagle is off. Man to man. <laughs> Boy, he says, you know your gun. I told him every nut and bolt and thing. How you laid a battery. How, uh, how the FTC gives the fire direction center. Gives our commands. We get, what we do with this. How we do this. The gun does this. It goes so far. Turns around. Somebody said, holy God. He said, I don't want an officer to tell me. They don't know what those officers know. Just, I'm an officer. I don't know nothing. Very, very good. After the meeting, I go back to my tent. The runner comes to me. He's at it again, Gunny. Captain was to see you. He's spitting. He's spitting. And now what the hell is He come out. Oh, he is mad. What's the matter with you, Gunny? This is the last thing. This is the end of the story now. He says, what am I going to do with you, Gunny? I said, what did I do? What did you do? You don't know what you did? No, what did I do? You shook hands with the colonel. He's an officer, and a list of men does not shake hands with an officer. What is, don't you know, uh, pedicle? Whatever they call it, you know. He says, don't you have no manners? Don't you know what you're doing? My officer, half my officer, didn't shake his hand. And my second lieutenant, then, there's a few captains and majors and a couple of first lieutenants. And you shook the colonel's hand. You don't shake the colonel's hand. Big deal. He's bitter. He says, what am I going to do with you? Then the next day, they dropped the atomic bomb. And I knew the war was going to be over. Two days later, they dropped the second atomic bomb. And he says, Gunny, you were the first ones to go home. I was getting Asiatic. I had 27 months overseas. 
That's a long time, two and a, two years and three months overseas. I was getting goofy in the head. I was getting, I, I, bet, I mean, I was half happy half goofy. That's a long time to be overseas, you know, in combat most of the time, especially in infantry. That really wore the hell out of me. That really wore the hell out of me. But I can still remember the last words he said to this captain, spitting all over. What am I going to do with you, Gunny? And I thought, boy, I tell you what I want to do with you. Yeah. But but you only shook hands with the colonel. Yeah. He shook hands. With, he wanted to shake hands. I, with I, I, I assumed, you know. I said, what's the big deal? The colonel didn't mind it. He didn't pay. That was after. I think that was after. after, 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 after yeah. But well, he got well done. But so, he was there. Oh, when you came back, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a natural thing yeah. to do. It's a natural thing. I don't know. This guy gets all shook up, you know. Uh, we had good officers. Bad but had you ever had you ever thought of making a career of of the Marines? No, no, I'm too little. I was a six foot six guy. I would say, yeah, yeah. So you got to kind of look the part. Yeah, yeah. Now these guys look at me. They, how the hell can you be a gunny? I never in my life dreamed to be a gunny sergeant. Holy Christ! Yeah, I I wish I would have taken a uh, getting the the Purple Heart though. I could have had the Purple Heart two times. I'm sorry I never took it. I had too much respect. For people with a Purple Heart, see, because now I, I go benefits when I go to VA, Great Lakes or something. Guys with Purple Heart, they get, I'm in class five. You get different classifications for your medical stuff. I would be able to get a lot more stuff medical if I had a Purple Heart. When, when was the first time you could have gotten a Purple Heart? We were, I was an infantry there, and we were like on a hill. Uh, I was a sergeant. We had this lieutenant there. What's his name? Virgil. He was from Evanston. I don't like that guy there. He was chicken. He was, the best. he was there. A corpsman was there. And there were about four of us. We were on top of this hill. We were about two, 200 yards behind the very, very front lines. We go, we're looking at the front lines with binoculars. And the Jeffs must have seen us too. They got binoculars. And they let our uh, mortars or shells come at us. And we slid down the hill. What well, a shell the hill is all coral. When you, uh. See, when you sit on a hill, it cut the heck out of your uniform, your pants, your your legs, you all cut up. And the corpsman says, well, come on to the tent. He says, I'll put my thigh lid on you so you don't get an infection. So we all dropped our pants, and we put my thigh lid on us. And then the doctor come in. He says, hi, Lou. The lieutenant just got Dr. John. Yeah, John, he says, uh, he says, I want the Purple Heart. No, the, the first lieutenant asked the corpsman if he can get the Purple Heart. He said, no. Lieutenant, you're not entitled to Purple Heart. He says, that's not enemy action. He says, it's just one of those things that happen. You got hit by an enemy fire itself, per se. He says, you can't get that. Then when the doctor comes, the lieutenant, hey, John, or whatever his name is. He says, the corpsman won't give me a Purple Heart. I want a Purple Heart. Doctor asked the corpsman, how about a corpsman? What about it? He says, no, doctor, he doesn't deserve it. He says, he just slid down. All these guys, they're all cut up from the coral, sliding down from the hill. I said, do you have Thought they were big shots or something on top of the hill. We were stupid for doing that. And oh come on, John, the lieutenant said, I want that purple that purple I look good in my uniform. He's but you're not entitled to lieutenant. Ah, oh, come on, you owe me a favor, Doc. Come on, I'll, I'll, I really I really owe you. Come on, give me a purple heart. Doc says, Oh come on, Carmen, write him up. He said the Carmen said, the rest of you guys, you want us? We don't want us. We don't deserve it. Yeah. Was that on was that on uh, No, do I've I've, I've, I've we were, uh, I Gloucester think Gloucester or uh, Pelu uh, or that was uh, Cape Gloucester. Cape Gloucester. No, I take Cape Gloucester. Yeah. Yeah, I could have got the Purple Heart. And he the got second, the Purple Heart. Yeah. We yeah. had too much respect for yeah. the people with a Purple Heart. Yeah. Another time we had, I could have got a Purple Heart when the, the, we were having a duel with artillery back and forth, and the, the Japanese uh, artillery hit our guns ricochet, and I got cut a couple, couple, three places with with their shell. I was entitled. The corpsman said, you want me right there? I was, forget about it. Patch me up. Forget about it. But I'm sorry I never took that Purple Heart. The second one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I deserved it. I could have had it, but I was a fool. I, first place I thought I'd never come out of the Marine Corps alive. In the infantry, I said, I'm going to be in a body bag. I'm going to be in a body bag. I know I'm going to be in a body bag. I never, never in my wildest dreams thought I was going to come out of it, out of the Marine Corps. Never thought about it. But, Oh, so many things happened to you. I would never give up my experience now for the Marine Corps. I went all over the world in that. Now, coming back to I went to Hawaii. I went to uh, two or three times. I went to Canada. I went to Hawaiian Islands. I, I, we went to Europe, England, Scotland, Wales. My wife and I, we traveled all over and everything else. 
But what are you going to do? Yeah. So, so you returned. You you're discharged from the service then in uh, yeah, Great Lakes. Yeah. Great Lakes in what is it in 1945? Four, yeah. In four years, in I did all four, that. Yeah, in December of 45. Yeah. 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 Did you have any cap? Did you have any difficulty readjusting to civilian life? No, I didn't get that. I had I had malaria attack. I was I wanted to get a driver's uh, chauffeur's license. Uh, you need a, a, a chauffeur's license to drive a truck. You know, I was downtown. Uh, the National Avenue, the, I forget what hundred block it is, you get your, your examination done for driving a truck. And I, I start shaking all over. I mean, I was shivering and shaking. And this Army Lieutenant see me, he's, you got malaria? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I feel, he took the fur coat off of her <laughs> and wrapped around me. Come in my car, he says, you go to Heinz. He says, you got malaria. <laughs> I went to Heinz and I was there four or five days, and just before Christmas, I wanted to get out. I said, I want to go home for Christmas. You know, I was thinking about the time, December 21st. It's hard to get out of the house. I couldn't get out. I had to go before a board. I said, I only had malaria. Now, I don't worry about malaria. I tell you, I can yell at John in school. It was just hepatitis, you know. But they don't even know that. I didn't even tell them about that. I don't care about that. And they finally let me go. I I, I, I hate Heinz. I ain't going to Heinz. I go to Great Lakes. So did you, did you come, well, your, your parents must have been happy to see you. Oh, yeah, oh, they, they never thought, thought I'd come out alive. And all your buddies. Yeah. yeah. And then were you able to go back, and, you know, your job was gone by then, was it, four years? Oh, years? yeah, I don't want to go back now. Yeah. yeah, I went back in the, I went to the milk business. That's when you went to work for Borden's? Yeah. Or how long were you with Borden's then? 11, 12 years. 11, 12 yeah. years, yeah. 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 Um, so. Now I'm applying service. I went to. Applying school, I do fix washing machine, dryers, refrigerators, freezers, everything but TV, top of the line. I worked for uh, Monkey Wards, I worked for uh, J.C. Penney's, I worked for Whirlpool. So. But then you you um, you must have you have mechanical aptitude. Oh yeah, I can look at something, fix it right away. When did you realize you had that in grammar school, I don't know, or high no. school, or I don't know, just I can look at something and fix it. When they the kid could buy a toy, they had directions, I told him, well, give me the picture. Look at the picture, I can put it together. I can just pick it together. I'll tackle anything. Yeah. I just do that when I, when I fix an air conditioner too. Everything was just come natural, 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 natural to me. Yeah. I worked with commercial, now I did residential. In between jobs, I worked with a uh, Certified of America. It's a commercial outfit. Now, I had to join that union there too. But I was only an apprentice. I didn't know nothing about commercial stuff. I was a gopher. Go for this, go for coffee, do this, bring this, and do all that stuff. You know. But I did know refrigeration and air conditioning. I didn't know that. But not commercial stuff. So there was a, a candy shop on Western Avenue near Pratt. It was like a Fannie Mae candy, but not Fannie Mae's. But all beautiful white in there and all these chocolates and everything else. And this company that I worked for, they just hired me. I only worked for about a month or two. And they had trouble there. They put a whole new unit in there, all new air conditioning and everything else. And the guy's chocolate would melt. They couldn't know, understand why. And the guy was raising the heck. All of this expensive stuff, like hand Fannie Mae stuff. And they went over everything. They said, what's wrong? And they, they sent the best men. They looked at everything. There's nothing wrong. Why is this chocolate melting? They said, send Charlie. They said, what the hell is Charlie? No, he's a gopher. So I go there. I go, I said, I know what your problem is. I said, there was a Japanese, the Chinese laundry right next to Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, they had a water uh, condenser on the, on the roof. The water goes over and cools the Freon and it comes back in there. And this guy, when he did certain laundry at a certain time of the day, he had the, the air vents blow the hot air and go over by the water, heat the water. It wouldn't cool the, the, the Freon. And that's when the stuff melted. I said, you got to go at a certain time when the Chinaman is doing all his steam work. All his steam is coming there, going in the air conditioner, and that's why it's is melting. Ah, damn, we didn't get a bottle of that. <laughs> you didn't get a bottle of whiskey that time. No, no, no. no, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't, uh, you didn't have a, too much difficulty readjusting to civilian life. Yeah, it didn't bother me, no. You're no. happy to be I don't home. have no dreams and all that stuff. But I can get malaria anytime I want. 
if I boost it up, I don't have a lot of sleep. I drink a lot. And I don't eat a lot. I don't get a lot of sleep. I start shivering and shaking. Then my wife comes and puts two or three blankets on me. She gets, makes me hot tea with a couple of shots of booze in there, three or four aspirins. I, I, dude, I sweat like a pig. The bed is ringing wet, and I, I get rid of my malaria. But it's still in your it, system. It, you'll never get rid of it. It lays dormant. Just like a person has syphilis. you never get rid of it. I know a guy that had syphilis and the death certificate, syphilis. It stays dormant in your body. When your resistance gets low, it, gets it comes back, back again. Yeah. Right back again. You Did you meet your wife after the war? Yeah, I met her. Yeah, after the war. Yeah. I come out of the war, my, my, my sister belonged to a women's club because there was nothing during the war. There's no men. And all these girls get together and they would have their, have their get together during the war. And then after the war, I was dating off and on there. And my, 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 uh, my sister says, I got a nice girl in that club. And she said, would you want to date? Said, yeah, okay, I'll take her. So we went downtown. My sister just got married. And then with my, with my wife now, we went down downtown. And we danced and whatever it was. And, that. and we come back home. I said, how, how do you like her? Ah, she was all right. I didn't pay any attention. Did I? A couple months later, I said, ah, maybe I'll give her a call. I called her up. <laughs> After that, that was it, boy. <laughs> I had stars in my eyes. That was her. <laughs> you were awake. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was back in the 40s. Yeah, I got married in 47. Yeah, so she, 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 yeah. did she ever see you in a uniform or anything? No, never, no. Seen me, yeah. never seen me. And did you stay in touch with a lot of, any of your buddies from the Marines? I got one guy I, I correspond with now. I'll bring you his picture. You won't recognize. He looks like Frankenstein now when he was in the Marine Corps. Picture of Marine. Beautiful guy. What was his name? Maurice Crumry. 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 Yeah. He's in he's in San Diego. He went out in 27 years. He stayed in the Marine Corps. And his wife's very sick. He comes up and visits me sometimes up here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, did you join the VFW or? Yeah, I, I belonged to the Marine Corps League in Arlington Heights. I belonged to VFW uh, Niles 7712. I belonged to uh, Martin Grove Post 134 uh, American Legion. So I belonged to all. Of them. I belonged to Elk Club, and I belonged to the Moose. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the Army of the Marines. You're an I, go, my wife, my wife, I fall two or three times a week. I golf. I do everything. For 90 years old, I think I'm doing pretty good. You're fabulous. Yeah. You, got, you got a university named yeah. after you? Yeah. The shirt says Monster University. I thought they have in the magazines where they have that thing. Yeah. You can have anything you want to put on yeah. it. Everybody gets a kick out of that. So uh, when we come to the end of an interview, we always we always ask these uh, kind of questions. and. Um, um, how do you think being in the military affected your life, your military experience? How did it well, affect your life? Well, the way it didn't affect me mentally, you know, a lot of guys can't stand war. I like war stories. I mean, that don't, that don't bother me. But it brought my mind going all over how people live so differently, the way they think. I wouldn't give up my experience in the Marine Corps for the world if I knew now what I knew then or something like that. But the war didn't affect me. But like now, I think the war is yes, senseless. And the Marine, and they holler about Truman using the atomic bomb. That's the best thing they ever did is use an atomic bomb. The Japanese for, for fanatics. We went there, we would lose a million men at least. Sure, we bombed two different cities like that. But what did, what did we do? Germany bombed England, didn't they? The Brits, they, the cities, everything else. What did we do? We did the same thing to the Germans. We, we bombed them mercilessly. The same thing with Japan. We, 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 we firebombed the whole Tokyo. And what do we do with the atomic bombs? We would, uh, cities, nurses, uh, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, innocent people. They were killed, yes. But there was only a few thousand, hundreds, a couple hundred thousand. The Marines, they're not the Marines, the whole, uh, allies, but they lost over a million men. Yeah. Right there. So Truman did the right thing with that bomb. I don't care what anybody says. The, the Japanese yeah, most were of the, fanatic fighters. Yeah, most of the... The vets all say that. Yeah, yeah. And the one man yeah. said, uh, he said we were expecting to invade Japan. Yeah. And he said I would. He said my I, luck. I probably wouldn't be here. He said my luck would have been up. Yeah, me too. My numbers should have been up long, long time. Why? I don't know. That's what he said. I don't. I don't. Our guy's getting shot here. Our guy's getting shot here. And no, I ain't getting shot. Why? I, I don't know. The Japs come in. I, you're talking about a carbine. Well, we had a rising gun. That was no good. The Marine Corps got rid of that. It had a wire stock and a rising gun. It was something like a machine gun, but a rising couldn't control it. 
Then they gave me a carbine when I was in combat, and the jacks were coming at me, and bam, 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 I hit him about three times in the chest before he fell. And I said, I don't want to have too light. The carbine has 30, uh, 15, 15 shells in, 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 in the clip, see, where we had the Marine Corps, we had the old old threes, the Springfield, bolt action. We didn't get the M1s till later on. The Army got everything first. See, the, uh, the United States figured they wanted to fight the war in Europe first, win that, and Eisenhower got everything, and then later on, everything would go to the Pacific after they fought, which is a good strategy. But we would had a bunch of old stuff. So then it gave me the carbine. That was good too, but it didn't have enough, enough firepower. So then I went back to the, uh, I could carry a machine gun, but I had a drum machine gun because they were too clumsy. I had a, a, a Kevin Japanese there. I shot the top of his head off, whole top of his head, brrrm, and he was still kicking, moving. Unbelievable, the reaction your body has. You, you think the guy is dead, and they're not dead. So when I got to, I was on patrol, I would always have uh, the, uh, my uh, Springfield. But then they were coming at us one, then we got the M1s, finally got the M1s. That eight in the clip. See, the, uh, the, the Springfield had five in the clip only, and you had to go bolt action. And the and, uh, M1, you got eight in the clip, you push it in there, and eight rounds in there, it's automated, gas fed. Boom, boom, you pull the trick as fast as you want. See, and we had that. The jacks were coming at us, fire, fire, hit them, hit them, and bang, 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 I'll shoot. I opened the clip by my pocket with the cartridge belt. I don't want that again. I tried to pull the clip out. I couldn't do it. Flip another pocket, couldn't pull it out. The web shrunk. In the jungle, it rained all the time. You're, in, you're always in rain and mud and dirt and filth. War is only guessing between Europe and Pacific. So I said, never again will I have a cartridge belt. I have my cartridge belt with two cans of water, yeah, and my first aid pad, but I have bandolier. It comes in a silk thing with bandoliers, and it's all silk. You take the clip out one, two, three. I had, just like you see in the movies, that's what you had. Two clips here. The heck with my cartridge belt. Because yeah. the jets were really coming out. Come on, firepower, firepower, let's go, let's go. In fact, I couldn't pull the clip off fast enough. Yeah. So I said, hereafter, I'm not going to, I'm going to rely on that bandolier. Yeah. Mr. Mites, how do you, um, the last question we usually ask the vets is, how do you think your experiences um, influence your view of war today? Hmm. Well, I really shouldn't be, you don't really achieve anything. Well, what happens with a war, it starts off good. They leave the generals run the war. But later on, the politicians run the war. The war should be run by the general. Let them win the war. That's what MacArthur wanted to do with Russia. We had 10 million men on the arms. We could have kicked the hell out of Russia. But they backed off to Russia. But MacArthur was wrong with Truman, of course, when Truman relieved them of his command. But uh, uh, normally, the politicians stick their nose in there, and they don't know what, they don't know nothing. So why did the, uh, the, the servicemen do within reason? you got to keep them underneath your control at a certain extent. But don't direct and tell them what to do. You, make, you want to make peace. There's no such a peace. We haven't won a war since World War II. We were in Korea. What did we do? We didn't win that war. We were in Vietnam. We didn't win that war. We're still uh, goofing off with that. We've been in a war in Iran, Afghanistan now, for eight years. We won the World War II, the biggest war there was in four years. Here we're eight years, and we're no better off than we started. Now, we have no business in there, because we, we want somebody to come in this country tell us what to do. Well, our religion, they want a, you want a democracy? Maybe those people don't want it. Thousands and thousands of years. Leave them have their own country. We have no business. Get out of there. That's why those people hate us. We were, we're a bunch of snobs. We think we are everything we do is right. They, can, they got their own country for thousands of years. Let them have their country. But there's pro and ra and, and, and on both sides. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but everybody reverts back to money. They make so much money now. These guys, millionaires, being made overnight with all of these manufacturers and all these guys going overseas. These uh, these guys that you know suppliers and everything else. They're making so much money is going out now. We're spending ten times as much as we ever did in the regular big war. Why? Why do we need such a big navy? Who are we fighting? There's nobody with a navy. So why do we need a, a $5 billion uh, aircraft carrier with 5,000 people? There's nobody to fight. We don't need nobody. The Russia, their, their, their fleet is all rested up. They ain't got nothing. The Japanese ain't got nothing. We're, we're fighting the guys with, with, with black pajamas, actually. And these guys are kicking the hell out of us. 
they haven't got anything. We got we got air force, we got artillery, we got uh, bombers, we got uh, everything you can think of. And those people, you got nothing, and they still uh, cabin us up to fight the war. They, they're fighting us toe to toe, and they got nothing. Because our politicians are sticking their nose in there. They should stay out of there. They don't know nothing. Within reason, but there's pro and con and everything. I understand that. I'm broad minded enough to realize that. I don't know everything. I'm just one little bald headed guy. <laughs> well, Mr. Brock, you, you know a lot. You've seen a lot. Well, the story that gets told that, that uh, you know. Is there anything? Just, is there anything you didn't say that you want to say? Oh, now, or? all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Every, everything I could, I, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could think of, but. It's unbelievable what happened to me. Every I, and I talk to my buddies. We go over beer and drink for, for hours and hours. They laugh. They land on Florida. Since when I joined the, the, the Marine Corps League out in Arlington Heights, we rent the Hall of American Legion there. Because it's only a small uh, detachment of rent there. And the, every, when you join the, the Marine Corps League up there, uh, you gotta give you ex your experience over there. And usually at one meeting. It took me two meetings to tell my story, and they were laughing. They never heard anything so so funny in their life. They say, "Oh my God, these guys are all veterans. They know BS when they hear it." You know, but I got kind of mad at them. I dropped out of them, the Marine Corps League, because what happened is, uh, I I was doing service on refrigeration and so forth. I went to Great Lakes as a civilian, of course, and there was a, a Marine Marine captain up there. And that's when Glenview was still there. You know, he was a Glenview, he was a fire, fire pilot, or whatever he was. And I was fixing the refrigerator. And I told him I was a Marine. He said, I'm being shipped out, he says. I want to give you that plaque. It was a Marine Corps plaque, all red with a gold a Marine Corps emblem on there. Beautiful vel red velvet with this gold a frame. Beautiful thing. Oh, he was uh, foot by foot. He gave me. This is for you. He said, I'm being shipped out. He said, he'll probably get busted anyway. He gave it to me. So what I did, when I joined this Marine Corps League out here, I went to the undertaker. And I said, hey, you got one of them flower stands? You know, with the flowers? Oh, he said, come in the garage. Take all you want. I got a hundred of them. He said, take a flower stand. So I took a flower stand. I brought it to the Marine meeting. And I put that thing on there. I said, now when Marine dies, you put that next to the casket. Beautiful. You know, it will look wonderful, right? I have a very a lot of good ideas. Nobody knows what happened to that. Somebody stole it. I said, here I give it, I goodness of my heart, give this plaque to the Marines. I said, when the guy dies, you can put it there. It would really look, oh, it looked beautiful, better than the flowers, right? It was a beautiful piece. And somebody took it, they probably got in a bar in a basin from I said, I'm, I quit this off, and I said, no. Anybody would steal something like from a fellow Marine. You don't do that to a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, and you stick together. Why is that once a Marine, always a Marine? You drill that in your head right away. We never leave our bodies. We don't leave nobody. We get you. We, we, we don't care who you are. We'll keep, still get you. It's your spirit. You've got to stick together. You stick together. It's like the police department. You get shot, you're a civilian, right? When a policeman gets shot, what happens? Oh. They go mad. They go in anybody's house. They don't need a search warrant. They don't need none. They'll go bananas. they got to stick together. It's only a few of them. There are millions of other ones. So you got to stick together and strong. And the Marines, we think we're better than everybody else. That's why I never want to go in the Army. The Marines are the best. But I've met a lot of good Army people. They could better than the Marines I know. They were dead. Um, they're, they're good in every. Everybody's good. But you went into the Marines though because you liked that. You didn't want to go in the army. You didn't want to go in the, why didn't you want to go in the army? Because it was. Uh, nah, they take all the riffraff. They they, they kind of take everything. They take everybody. They take everybody. Yeah. They, the Marine Corps is more selective. You yeah. just they weren't taking anybody. Yeah, you could have been in the Raiders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I would then go to that chemical warfare school first, that yeah. that saved my ass. I really got saved there. Yeah. It's one of those things. Yeah. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, whatever. Oh, things things that happen to me, oh, I don't know. Well, Mr. Mike, that's a wonderful interview. Oh. Thank you very much well, for coming. Well, I could keep talking and talking, talking but... Uh, well, you know, if, if there's, you know, we, when you read the interview, if there's something that you think, oh, i I got to get this uh, in there, we can we can add it, you know, oh. we can add to it. But we got about an hour and uh, 45 minutes now. Oh, <laughs> That's good to This is wonderful, wonderful, very descriptive. And you have such a wonderful memory. Well, for remember, I, some memories I know, sometimes I don't. Like, a lot of times I got to ask a lot of questions, but you just roll. It was wonderful. Like diarrhea. You say you don't get diarrhea. 
or seasickness. I got seasickness twice. I had diarrhea real bad twice. What happened, we were in California at Maneuvers there by, by the Chocolate Mountains. That's in California by Imperial Valley. And that's when I had this uh, KP duty. I got it on bad list with the first sergeant, of course. And then we were at Maneuvers. We come out, it was t 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had to pull out. Emergency. Go right out. To, you know, make up, believe something happened. So we went out, the, out into near Imperial Valley, they call that, in there by the Chocolate Mountains, and we stopped there. That's where I'll be at home for the next two weeks. See? Now, then we, were, we weren't cooking. Our, our guys weren't cooking. Uh, we got in these big steel containers uh, uh, ham and eggs and stuff for breakfast. And all of a sudden, boom, everybody started getting diarrhea. You, the guy drop his pants, you'd hold him, and boom, you'd drop him, dig a little sand hole, and you had to go diarrhea. Everybody had diarrhea. So what did they do? They called all the doctors and nurses, everybody around the whole area, in the Imperial Valley, that's near El Central, that's where you got your fruit and your vegetables in there, in El Central. That's one of the big cities there, or towns, whatever it is. And the first thing they gave us was some kind of a, uh, croton oil, something like that, olive oil, something to, to make, get rid of uh, the, the your, flesh it, yeah. yeah, flesh it up. Then they get the bismuth and paragoric. Now, I don't know what bismuth and paragoric is, or something like that. You had to go from Corman to Corman, from desk to desk to doctor, and you got, had to take that. Then the last desk, you'd get opium, regular opium, tablets, because you were, they, they, were, they wouldn't lose no men, you get, they wanted you to relax. Get dopey, you know, like sleep it off. Your nature would take over. The ne next time I had diarrhea was the whole outfit was in on the west, uh, east coast in the Camp Lejeune. I was going to learn to be a, a truck driver. I want to get a license to drive a truck in a Marine Corps. Now you do that, you got to drive a jeep. Then you got to drive uh, an ambulance. Then you had to drive a, 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 a one-ton truck. Then you had to drive a ten-wheel truck. The big ones. The last thing you had to drive was a tractor. You know, regular cat, like a farmer has a tractor and everything, get to pull an artillery piece. Well, I didn't, I, I, we had a break for lunch before I, I went for that. I passed all the other tests. So we all went to lunch. We ate in this mess hall where we have ham and eggs and stuff like that. We come back. I got on a, on a tractor. I start weaving all over. I fall off the track. All of us got diarrhea. Now, this was a beautiful camp, Camp Lejeune. Beautiful grass, the hospital and everything else. All the nurses come out holding the guys. Guys were pooping all over in the grass, dirt, and oh, all over. It was unbelievable. And it, it hits you just like that. Somebody could have bar, called through a bar of soap in there. You sabotage. It could be anything. I don't know. But, but everybody got it. Everybody got it. Well, you got 280 guys eating in one mess hall. Yeah. You get it. You get it. The only two times they have it. So did you, did you have to do the... Olive oil and the... No, no, I didn't do that. I don't, what we, I don't remember yeah. no more what we did in, in uh, North Carolina. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just one of those things. I had different officers. When I was training there on, in Camp Lejeune, we had this one guy. He was punch drunk. He was a, a fighter at one time. He got hit in the head too many times. And I felt sorry for the guy. He was a nice officer. We were training. We were going to these Quonson huts. And... and uh, guys would hit the stove like a bell, and he'd jump up in boxer stance. See, he was so oh, yeah. in the head. We took us on marches every day. The other guys didn't, the other companies didn't do it. Our outfit, you got to be physically strong. We kill those chaps like nothing. Kill. He didn't last too long. He got chance or something. We got Captain Lombardo, like Gary Lombardo, the orchestra leader. Yeah. He was a small little Italian guy. You don't fight him with muscle. You fight him with your head. You got to use your head. Brain, you got to be smarter than the other guy. He wanted to play just the opposite. Every quantum hut was different. This you had no uh, 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 map reading. This you had no first aid. This you had not have no communication. This you had no this. Use your brain power, you'll fight them better, have them smarter than have all the muscle. Muscles don't mean nothing. He just that's yeah, just the opposite. See the way it is. Day and night, different. Every officer you get, a, a different officer. Some officers you're going to worship. Some officers, well, they can't all be good. Yeah. So, what are you going to do? Yeah, that, that was funny. That. See, I got the, when I got into first trouble when I was still in California out of boot camp where I got the KP duty, uh, me and this guy named Applebaum, a young Jewish guy, 
And he's, he's a funny thing. His name is Applebaum, and his, he come from Appleton, Wisconsin. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now his doc, his husband, his dad was a doctor, a dentist. Now he got money, and I always got money. My parents always sent me five or ten dollars in the envelope. You know, when I came. now it was a lot of money. Depression. You have a dollar or two. That was a lot of money. Well, we didn't. We were kind of spoiled. We had the money. The other guys didn't have the money. We didn't eat the food. We went to PX, got ham sandwiches, cookies, cartons of milk, and then we go to show, watch, watch the show in Camp Elliott. Well, they, they had a formation they called out, but we weren't at the formation. The formation to tell you every day you got to have different uniform, greens and khaki, all khaki. That's the uniform of the day. Well. We were in uniform in the day. We went to the PX and got our cookies and ham sandwiches. Went to the show. We got out of the show just before taps, before 10 o'clock. And all the lights on. The taps were going. No taps. All the lights are all on. We're moving out. Emergency. We're moving out. We come, I come in, in the barracks. You guys are in trouble. First sergeant, he mad at you at Apple Bomb. What do we do? We're moving out. We're moving out at 3 o'clock in the morning. You guys weren't here. I can see the first sergeant. You guys had a KB dude six weeks. Now I got to bring you to the supply sergeant. Now he's got to open up the supply hut. He's got to give you leggings. He's got to give you this. He's got to give the. We're moving out. You guys weren't. Where were you guys? We went to the theater. What did you weren't here at, 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 at the child call? We, no, we missed that. Oh, you, we're going to fix you. That's when the first time I got in trouble, I got in the first sergeant. Now it's on KP duty for six weeks. Me and Applebaum. Oh, God. Here we are on, the, on, the, on that desert when we were coming out of on this here maneuver. And it, we were on KP duty. Well, it, it's, it gets real hot in the summertime. And in the wintertime, I mean, not, when it gets nightfall, it gets real cold. You get your brain. Him and I were sleeping together. We had our blankets together, a grass green, a poncho over us. It was so cold. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had to be there. We had a certain temp because then the the, the, um, the guard would come over and wake us up at 4 o'clock in the morning because we were on KP duty. We had these uh, garbage cans cut in half and had water. One water was soap water, hot water, hot water. We had to start the fires. We were what they call pot wallopers. When the cooks get through with the pots, we got to clean the pots. They don't do that. We, we're the suckers. We got to do the flunky work. That's we were, KP business? Yeah, KP. KP. Oh, we, we kitchen police. We had a rotten job that way. But then we had a break after 10 o'clock. We, we, we wash our, our underwear and whatnot and take the, the tobacco stains out. They cut the tobacco stains in your shorts, you know, little poop. Oh, yeah. They had strong soap in your brushes. You put that in your cactus, bleaches the white. Beautiful, beautiful. Then you look like an old time marine because the uniforms, you put them on a sagebrush and the sun bleaches them. Now look almost white. Now you're a, red, a China marine, an old time marine. See? I remember the old, we were in Camp Elliott at one time, another uh, uh, gunning sergeant. He was a real big guy, too. He was a China marine. He was actually in China for years and years in the Marine Corps for a thousand years. Great big guy. He'd make coffee on an oil stove, a pan of coffee. Half of it was coffee and water. He put iron on there if it's, if it's, if it's sunk. Coffee wasn't strong enough. That's how strong it had to be. So he was telling us, we all gathered around him and listened to BS stories <laughs> about China. So well, he's telling us all kinds of stories. And he's telling about all the beer he's drinking. And this young corpsman was going to go on liberty. See? And he stopped and listened to the gunny sergeant. And the gunny said, oh, I drank five, six, seven beers. And the guy pops up. He says, you couldn't do that. He says, your kidneys wouldn't hold it. He says, who the hell are you talking to? The gunny sergeant to this young uh, corpsman. You know, a young kid. He's coming out of, out of medical school. He says, the Bahamian body can only hold uh, one, one quart, blah, 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 ounces and so forth, and milligrams, whatever it was. He says, baloney. He says, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Dad, I, the gunny, that's what it is. Come on, go get me a urinal. He got it currently. Now you sit down. He said, put that urinal between your, your legs. The guy's in his dress uniform. He's going to liberty. The gunny side took out his wang. He peed. He said, don't you move. He filled that urinal, went all over the guy's pants, all over his shoes, all over. He was going to go to go. He said, that shows how much you know, he smart ass. <laughs> he got to go home to uniforms. <laughs> the gunny side, I can drink a lot of beer like that too. 
You'd be surprised as your body, because when I went to school, I got to go a lot. Then. Oh, yeah. But the uh, first time I can drink a lot of beer, and it's gunny shards, and I had to laugh. This poor guy didn't know what the hell he's going to do. His whole year for his whole full year, he told you he was going to smash you right in the face. <laughs> yeah. you, you, now you know so much. You think you know everything, huh? Because you went to, went to medical school. <laughs> that was funny. I mean, it's stuff like that. I can tell you, stories like they just don't come around. Yeah. Then we get, once in a while we go with our officers, but they take their bars off. Because see, they can't associate with the militia men. Officers can. Okay. Is that a good idea? That's a good policy? Yeah, because you, you lose the respect for the officer then. Because like, he might have been a solar jerker, he might have been a chemist with them, because he didn't finish school or college or something. You're a listed man. Now he's an officer, he's God. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it ain't right, but that's what they do. It's better for but, the organization. Yeah. You know. But they brought us a lot of college songs and everything. Like they say, here, here goes number one, drink it down. Here goes number one, drink it down. Here goes number one, and we're out to have some fun. Here goes number one, drink it down. Then you all drink. See? Then you see, well, I'll skip number two. Here goes number three, drink it down. We're here it goes, number three, drink it down. Here it goes, number three, and we're out on the spree. Here it goes, number three, drink it down. Then you drink it down. Here it goes, number four, drink it down. <laughs> Here it goes, number four, drink it down. Here it goes, number four, and we've got her on the floor. Here it goes, number four, drink it down. Now it gets hotter and hotter. Yeah. Anymore. But I forget all of her. That was a college drinking song. Yeah, that was a college drinking song. Did they talk? Yeah, they, 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 they often brought it to us. You know. yeah. I, can, I remember up to 11, now I don't forget them. I know. Three or four of them, I'd forget all about them. But we had a good time. Our, our, we had some good officer. We had a real good officer. Now, we uh, they Camp Elliott there. This first sergeant that we had now, a tall, thin guy from Montana or someplace, uh, Oregon, up in there, anyway. And nobody liked him. He was really a strict for a guy, you know. Yeah. Let me just... Uh This guy's name is uh, First Sergeant uh, Graham. And uh, Friday's the organized grab ass day. So if you got to do it, athletics. All day, they, and they get ready for inspection. For Saturday morning, then you go on Liberty. And that organized grab ass, you play basketball, football, boxing, wrestling, anything in sports to keep you uh, physically fit, you know. And this guy, First Sergeant, was a boxer. Oh. And we said, boy, we're going to get, everybody wanted to get in the ring with him. These great big Marines, they said, I'm going to kill that so-and-so. They went, <clears throat> he, said, yeah. he was a pro CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization, when they had that in years and years, big, years big ago. Big, big thing, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was so fast. I went in there, I lasted about two seconds. I was going to hit him, and <clears throat> I was laying down. Was he fast, this guy was. Oh, everybody wanted to kill him, but they were so anxious to kill him, they left themselves wide open. Yeah. He'd come right in there and knock, knock right down. And he got to, he went to OCS, Officer's uh, uh, Training School, you know. He gave me an officer, he made an officer, but I lost track of him. But he was a fast officer, off, good first sergeant that way. He was fast. Made a lot of good ones, a lot of bad ones, what he got to? Yeah. That's the way it is. But oh, so many things happen, oh, I'm telling you that. Un unbelievable, unbelievable. I won't take out any more of your time. So I think this um, this spring on on television, I think on HBO, they're going to have that series on the Pacific. Oh. It's supposed to be like um, like the Band of Brothers they had for Euro Europe. They're going to have the same thing uh, for the Pacific, I mean, the same kind oh. of an idea, oh, yeah? oh, based yeah. on a couple of Marine uh, kings. I think they're following a Marine unit. Yeah. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. See, the, the war in Europe is all they get is different. It's more like civilian war. It's war as hell, no matter where you're at. Yeah. But in the Pacific, you have the temperature to go. You get the bugs and snakes. And else. I'm sitting on a, on, on a throne, two or three pot, pots here in a Marine store, sitting on a toilet, and a big snake comes by. You don't move, it just goes away. What do you mean? We were in combat one night there, and uh, three guys were sleeping together. Uh, this real guy, his name is Corporal Regal. And the two two communication guys. Well, they, they put the ponchos over together. It was raining, of course. And they were there. 
and the branch broke off a big tree in the jungle. Everything's rotten. Everything's rotten in the jungle. You know, it fell off, hit this guy right in the back. It broke his back. And this guy was as nice as Marine. I'm going to kill 50 Japs. I'm going to do this. He volunteered for every, every work in detail. And he was the best Marine you ever see. Never seen action. Never seen action. The tree broke off. He was sitting at least sleeping in the middle. The tree hit them. The other two guys weren't hurt. The, the big tree hit him right in the back somehow. The carman had to carry him. What happened to him? I don't know. But that's the way actions happen. You, you never yeah. know who it is. Just yeah. like that first lieutenant got three days with us and he was dead. That was on Okinawa. Uh, the, yeah, I think it was on Okinawa. Yeah. That was yeah. Okinawa. Yeah. Yeah. Because it goes on and on and on like that. You also knew going to maneuvers. You go down on the nets, you know, you got a lot of equipment. You got your helmet, your, 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 your weight of all the ammunition, your backpack, your shovel, canteens of water. And you slip, you fall in a drink, you go down. It's hard, you're supposed to be able to flip it off, but you don't make it. You always lose four or five minutes, and men who always. But they say you, I know what they say to their parents when they give them, you know, tell them they died, they tell them died in action or died, how they died, I don't know. But it always happened. They probably always, drowned, right? Or yeah. something? See, when I went in the first one, one of the combats I went, went in, uh, of course I was a sergeant at that time, but this uh, gunny sergeant, this other guy, I didn't know who he was, he come alongside me, we crapped out there, it was at night, and he says, uh, you want a drink? I said, I got my own water. He says, I asked you if you wanted a drink. I had taught him my canteen of water. He pulled his ass from the gunny sergeant. Booze. Yeah. Boy, I needed that. I looked at his name, uh, Obzinski. I said, I was in boot camp with a guy, Obajinsky. He said, that's my kid brother. Wow. This kid, yeah. How, see, I meet anybody? I said, what happened to him? I said, he went in the radars. Ooh. He was all shot up. He, he, he just got discharged from the Marine Corps. He said, I'm staying in. I'm a 30-year I'm a man. I said, but, I said, I remember your brother. He carried a flag. He was the, the top guy, carried a flag, a pin or whatever it is, in the, in the, in the boot camp. He's the top guy, always got that. Well, this guy was Marine Corps happy, kind of his brother, you know. I didn't know my left foot from my right foot on that. The way you meet up guys with different guys like that. Yeah. No, I had a, I had so much fun in the Marine Corps. The, the, the songs and singing and we go in the slop shoot. Slop shoot has a beer hall, you know. And buy a couple of cases of beer and you had to either tell a joke or sing a song or do something else. We'd take a beer out of your case. Oh, you got your case, and then you mark your name on it and put it on the side. And the sergeant would keep it in the beer hall for you. We, we could put away a lot of beer. Boy, we put the beer. And you all had to come with a joke, a decent joke, or a song. Well, I don't know anything. Take your case. Come on, everybody takes a bottle of beer. <laughs> you come home pretty happy. Yeah. yeah. We had a lot of fun in the Marine Corps. Yeah. We first went in the Marine Corps. We we got. You'd sit at a table, and the, the, the other boots would serve you, shall. Big platters of sauces, eggs, anything you wanted. They, you would serve us big pots of coffee, cartons of milk, fresh fruit, everything. Then later on, they'd dock that off, and so everybody kept coming in. You couldn't, couldn't do that, individual. There was like 10 people on a, on a, on a uh, it was like, there was like uh, 10 people on a table. Now we got those metal trays. And you go to a chow hound, chew, chew, chew a chow line, and they slap the stuff on your. That's that, none appetizing, none appetizing. See, we first went in the Marine Corps. Two, you could come out, take a shower, you could throw your money on your bunk. Nothing was lost. It was there. Now later on, when the drafties start coming in, the riffraff we call it a riffraff. You put it in your locker with a lock on it. They break it and take your money. Yeah. A lot of thievery goes down there. A lot of some good Marines, most of them are real good Marines, but you get always got to get guys that they're different. They come from, well, you don't know where they come from, different parts of the country, and maybe they come from a very bad area that where they had to make a living. Dog eats dog, you know. Yeah. They didn't have no standards. Uh, yeah, a lot of the vets, when they, uh, when they joined the service in World War II, they met people from all different parts yeah. of the country that they never had encountered before. It was yeah. Uh, yeah. an eye-opener. And how it is, it's an experience you'll, you'll never forget. You, you, you wouldn't want to give it up either. Yeah. yeah you wouldn't give it up, but what, what, I, what I know now. Yeah, yeah what are you going to do? But it's over, what, 65 years ago, 
I can't remember everybody's name. Some names I know. You have uh, you have fresh, vivid memories. I mean, it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great that you were able to come in today and uh, speak uh, at length on this. Uh, it really gives you an eye opener into battlefield conditions. Oh, I could I could tell you more stuff. I can't I can't think of them right now. Maybe if I had a couple of drinks. <laughs> then I would, I'd be able to tell you. I don't stuff. have permission for that. I got, I got to check with the colonel. Yeah. You're an Irishman. <laughs> I'll let you know with a drink. <laughs> uh, good Irishman, go Patty, turn over in the grave, find out you turned on a drink. <laughs> Did you have any with you? <laughs> anyway, I think that I think we'll uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop there, Mr. Thanks very much. I